that is true uh, but uh, uh, sorry it is audible but very feeble sound is it yeah okay. no no for audible you. audible for you probably i don't know about uh, How about how about their view? Ah, okay. Now yeah, come back. <laughs> There's some problem. Now, uh, I'm, see, what I said was that uh, the technology interventions, especially during the pandemic period, the testing of pathogens, the viruses in uh, 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 in, in human samples, and uh, the detection work. That... I don't know. Again. Hello. Am I audible? You are worried, you know, because I don't know. I see myself on the screen, but. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Audible, sir, please. Uh, I don't see the audience, you know. See, sometimes it is uh, probably, I don't know. Uh, okay. So we have, we have um, uh, helped people uh, to, to go for detecting uh, the pandemic, the, the viruses in the samples because there was technology in the, the real time PCR. It's a technology intervention uh, into science. So in most of the areas that we have technology and we should definitely specifically uh, project the advantages that you have gained through technology intervention. A classical example uh, that we have gained, the India, gained, India has gained is through the technology intervention in space technology. You know that uh, in 2019, I was attending a, the, the, the day when we were to celebrate uh, the landing of the, you know, uh, uh, sa satellite to the on the moon. It was all precisely and specifically being uh, managed because we had correct technology intervention in that. But then a final, which was just uh, uh, beyond the control of all the people, there was a minor failure. Otherwise, India would have been on top of the world. The first first country to land on the other side of the world. Unfortunately, we couldn't. But then understand all those advantages, developments that you've gained in, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the satellite technology uh, uh, through uh, uh, this technology interventions. So if you, if you look at it uh, in biology, in physics, in chemistry, uh, uh, everywhere in all the basic sciences, uh, all the progresses have taken place especially to speak of uh, the, the recent, uh, the, the, the fourth industrial revolution, we specifically speak about the robotics, artificial intelligence and nanotechnology. The robotics, you know that it has made a lot of uh, changes in, in our understanding uh, of how to, how to make uh, great things, including uh, the 3D printing of great uh, structures, uh, you can visualize, you can specifically uh, program it on the computer and print whatever you want, specifically uh, on the record time with great precision. So all those gadgets these days that you're getting, including the mobile phone uh, structures, all those shapes that you have, is all mainly because of 3D printing. That is, even people say that through 3D printing, we can build big houses, big um, mansions, buildings, whatever you want. Uh, and I'm sure that it's going to make a big transformation in our approach to technological intervention to the benefit of the society. Artificial intelligence, as you know, that again has helped us a, a lot, uh, especially in diagnostic processes, the human diagnostic processes. Uh, we have several uh, gadgets available, including the, inter the, the, the interventional uh, programs that is available that you could just penetrate any part of your body uh, to find out the defects in your body through uh, specific uh, artificial intelligence and the gadgets that are available. The, 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 uh, the other uh, most important technology is the nanotechnology. So, and I'm sure Professor Sopna is here, a uh, very great expert in uh, technology, uh, nanotechnology. And recently she was in the news because she came out with a, a nano coated uh, paper strip which could detect sodium levels in humans. You know, I'm sure it's a great breakthrough. I take this opportunity to congratulate uh, uh, Professor uh, Sopna for the great achievement. I'm sure that it's going to be taken by 
uh, many uh, industries so that you will have just by using a pepper strip, you would be able to go in for uh, finding out the sodium levels at the nick of the bag. That's a great achievement. Congratulations, Sukhna. And uh, uh, not only that, we have several other developments that have taken place in science and technology through this. Now, uh, using the nanotechnology, nano drug delivery, you know, that's most important thing, especially for those people who are uh, taking, uh, you know, chemicals, uh, the chemotherapy process for advanced cancer stages. Now, if, you know, one of those major problems that is uh, facing is that when you take uh, drugs, drugs to the body, the drug is not specifically going to the uh, space place where it should act. It takes it is taken by the entire body. But if you can uh, 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 put it into the nano particles uh, with the kind of uh, ligand receptor complexes, you would be able to deliver the drug exactly to the site that you want. The advantage would be that the rest of the body will be uh, saved from uh, the drastic impact of uh, the drug that is being delivered. So I'm sure it's going to be a boon to that. So if you look at all those things that have happened in science uh, and the fast growth that have taken place in science is mainly because that we have technology intervention. So technology and um, science are blended together and all the progress that is happening, of course, it is, it is complementary to each other. It's not that technology cannot survive unless there is scientific development. And scientists, scientific developments would hasn't uh, take up higher speed when you have the technology intervention. So there's, they are complementary to each other, but then understand the kind of great services, the technology that has done to us. I've just specifically said few, few of the areas, but there are empty areas where we are yet to look into uh, it to utilize the technology interventions uh, in science. I'm sure uh, days like this, uh, when, when you remember uh, the great services of the great scientists, if you, if you look at uh, what has happened in, in India, you have greater scientists, great scientists, starting with Professor C. V. Raman. There are so many uh, great scientists who have contributed a uh, lot to the development of science and technology. Uh, needless to say, uh, the day that you are you are you are uh, you know, observing today, uh, the the program blast uh, when uh, the, the Prime Minister of India, the former Prime Minister of India, uh, Professor uh, Sri uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, including uh, you know uh, the program was completely spearheaded by our respected former president of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And Dale View College has got a museum depicting his uh, contributions. So I am sure that uh, this is an apt time for um, uh, Dale View College to observe the National Technology Day uh, and remember the great scientists, not only APJ Abdul Kalam, uh, C.V. Raman, but to Homi Baba, to uh, Vikram Sarabhai, uh, to all those great scientists who have contributed, uh, Dr. You know, Dr. Um, uh, Varghese Kurian, uh, all those people have contributed a lot in the development of science and technology in the country. We cherish, and I'm sure that uh, the, the vision of uh, the country is to become a developed nation. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is not far away. I'm sure that we do not sh short time of time. If the pace of developments in science and technology is going to be like this, I'm sure that there'll be great developments. And I'm sure that we will be giants in science, in technology, in space technology, in computational uh, programs, uh, in nanotechnology, in robotics, in the artificial intelligence, and also their interventions in uh, saving human lives, like what you have seen, uh, the interventional programs that you have that are available, the diagnostic processes that are available. So you name it, there are a lot of developments that is taking place and it's all, we owe a great deal to the technology development and backed by the great scientific developments. I'm extremely happy that the Kerala Academy of Science could associate with Delhi College of Pharmacy uh, to organize this program. And I'm sure that we will be there to help you in organizing many programs. As I said, that uh, we have about 700 uh, members who are all technologists, who are all scientists, who are all medical professionals. Uh, and I'm sure that you ne never uh, see such a kind of blend of 
scientists, technologists, and medical professionals together in any of the organization in the country. So maybe that using the strength of Kerala Academy of Sciences, uh, the, the, the human strength that the scientific and technological strength that Kerala Academy of Sciences, definitely many of the institutions like Dale Vivek College of Pharmacy can benefit a lot in their uh, developments and in their activities. So I'm extremely happy that I'm uh, facing the students. I would have uh, loved to come and talk to you in person over there, but then I'm sure uh, we are now uh, almost tuned to this kind of uh, uh, online meetings, but we also enjoy, uh, we always enjoy the physical meetings rather than the online meetings. So that's why you get the feel of uh, the audience to you. So I wish uh, the, the there'll be College of Pharmacy uh, very well, the students very well, and I'm sure that all those students uh, with the backing of uh, the, the um, Dr. Mrs. Dina Das and uh, Dr. Shaiju. I'm sure that uh, you, you, there, there's no looking back. The Institute is going to grow very great. And especially uh, with the vision of uh, the great uh, you know, people who have started this institution uh, in, in the memory of that, uh, you have also, uh, I've seen uh, and I've been informed that uh, a postal stamp is being uh, released. And I, I really congratulate uh, dear daughter of Sri uh, Krishna uh, Das and uh, uh, the, the, the son-in-law, the great son-in-law, uh, Dr. Shaiju, for making this institution to grow, uh, taking exactly to the path which Dr. Krishna Das uh, has envisioned, envisioned, and I'm sure that it would go to great uh, heights in the course of time. And I'm so happy that I'm associated with this institution uh, to back them in their pursuits. Thank you very much and wish you all the best and declare. And I'm, I'm very happy to inaugurate this uh, meaningful uh, conference where we are going to listen to great people like Professor Sopna and uh, Dr. Uh, Anish. Thank you very much and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your informative addressing. Now, let's end it to our session. I would like to invite Dr. Sapna Nair, Director of Research and Project Cell, Central University of Kerala. Specialization on nanomaterial, multiparole, ferrofluid. After receiving her MSc and PhD from the Kochi University of Science and Technology, Dr. Sopna is now worked as a staff doctoral fellow in the University of in the Institute of Non-Material, Non-Device, and Non-Modular. She has published 58 year reviewed research articles and published two books. I welcome you, ma'am, on the talk on nanotechnology current trends and future scope for medicine and IoT. Hello, good morning to all. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Good morning, sir. So, thanks a lot uh, uh, for the introduction. Thank you for the Professor Dean sir. So he uh, is like our mentor, guide, and constant motivator. Thanks a lot, Professor for uh, suggesting my name. And um, Dr. Dina, Dr. Shaiju, uh, Professor Rani, Abraham, then my colleague, Dr. Anish, and all of us, all of the dignitaries who are uh, participating in the seminar and uh, the students from the Delhi uh, College. Uh, so uh, a very warm good morning to them all. So it's almost uh, uh, 11 o'clock. So, uh, in my talk, I will be focusing on the general perspectives uh, and the special trust on uh, nanotechnology for medicine because you are medical students. So I will be focusing more on the medicine side and then move into the uh, uh, advancement in nanotechnology uh, uh, and will introduce uh, the scope for the nanotechnology in the Internet of Things. This is a general topic which is uh, good for everybody. So I will not be focusing more on the other side. So let me uh, start introduction, let me uh, got the slides straight. 
So I hope the shares will be work. So this. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, host disabled uh, presentation. So would you allow me to present? Uh, Dina, ma'am. So could you allow me to present because? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Host disabled part participants uh, screen sharing. So can you make me a co-host? Otherwise, I will not be able to present. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Sapna, Madam, the rights to uh, display the screen, please. Okay, you have to make her the host. So the message host disabled participants screen sharing. So that means that you have to make me a co-host, otherwise the screen sharing will not be visible to the uh, participants. They can put the screenshot of this message to Dr. Shaitan. No, that's okay. Uh, I think they would do something. Uh, yeah. So, uh, definitely. But you, the meanwhile, you can talk. <laughs> Let it yeah, talk. Yeah. Without the slides, it may not be that much appealing for us. Okay, 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 okay. What so, is happening? I will, I will start with the uh, general introduction. By the time uh, when the screen sharing comes, okay, I can uh, talk. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now uh, I'm allowed to share. Fine. So I think I yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, put it in the presentation mode and proceed. Yeah. Okay, I hope it's uh, uh, visible to you. Right, the screen is visible to you, right? In full screen mode. Yeah. Please proceed. Please proceed. Uh, uh, good morning to one and all. So um, I'll be talking on this topic, nanotechnology, current trends and future software medicine and the internet of things. So this is my institute, uh, Central University of Kerala, located at the northern part, most part of uh, Kerala. Uh, it's a castle road uh, located in 360 acres of land and the buildings are slowly progressing only it's, uh, an area of the uh, university. And I have to start right from here. Actually, 21st century woke up with the doorbell of all these new technologies. You have to see quantum technologies is the uh, uh, newest one. Uh, and then you know about artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, biotechnology, then energy harvesters, semiconductor technology, and nanotechnology uh, has a prominent role in interconnecting all these. So that is why it is very much important because it, it is joining hands with all the other technologies, all the other prominent technologies uh, uh, that we are talking about like quantum technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics, and nanobiotechnologies, not just new even because it has started way back in uh, 1990s itself. And uh, nanotechnology has a lot to offer in the internet of things, energy storage, energy harvesters, and in semiconductor technologies like memory devices, storage, and uh, all those uh, sensing industries. So uh, it's a technology which merges with everything. So physicists will work uh, for its physical properties, Chemists will work for its uh, te uh, technology improvement, like uh, synthesis strategies, processing, etc. While the uh, technologies like material engineering, ceramic engineering, and electrical engineering people will take up this knowledge, make it into the devices. So that is why uh, oh, it, it is like a merging of hands of all these technology sites, and then uh, uh, where it has application, where not, I have to say. So it has got applications in everywhere, environment, medicine, biotechnology, and then uh, in the newest technologies like quantum information technologies, like quantum logic gates, then uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, everywhere it has good applications. That is why it makes it so unique so that uh, it has good applications. Uh, for, it has something to do with everything. So 
uh, I will be focusing mainly on the application side, uh, biotechnology and medicine, as well as the Internet of Things, which is used to everybody. And especially uh, as I'm going to talk to the medical students, I thought of focusing more on the biotechnology side. So, uh, as the uh, audience uh, is not from the uh, nanotechnology side, I'll just give a brief introduction about the word nano. Nano means one billion of a meter. So anything which is coming in that range, we can call it as nano. We, we, we don't have to make nano because nano is there uh, already in the world because atoms, uh, molecules, and small particles, everything is in the nano range. And DNA, uh, which is nano range. And this is a carbon nano tube, which is known to the world because nano, the word itself was known to the world through carbon nanotubes. So CNTs, uh, we call it as CNTs, carbon nanotubes. And these are gold nanoclusters uh, with different colors. That is why, okay, simply by earlier we thought like oh, all the properties are material. So uh, carbon sulfate or gold, gold we, when we think about gold, we have some peculiar color or peculiar appearance in our mind. But actually when we are reducing the science to the nano, it is not materialistic properties. It is completely different and it is size dependent properties. Now, gold can exist like this, can like this, it can be like this. So, it can have all these colors, it can have luminescence, it can have absorption in any range. So, anything is possible by changing the size. That is why nanotechnology has a lot of importance. By playing with the size, we can tailor the properties. Tailor the appearance, tailor the electrical properties, tailor the sensing properties. And playing with the surface, we can do a lot, which I will come to uh, uh, when I talk about the surface modification strategies for sensing as well as uh, imaging. This was some of the nanostructures. These are nano rods, which are smaller. Shorter means it's a road, longer one means a wire because all are one dimensional structures. So these are tubes and these are nano viscous and these are quantum dots. They're very small. You cannot, you cannot see uh, the dots, but it is uh, uh, visible from the fluorescence that uh, these uh, clusters are there. Otherwise, it will be colorless and we will not be able to see that. Now I'm coming to the biotechnology. So, what, what scope is there? In that? For nanotechnology in the field of biology and medicine, so it has a lot to offer, uh, like nano diagnostics. Diagnostics is the most important thing. Um, you have to first diagnose uh, the diseases uh, well before. So it gives early and accurate diagnostics uh, for uh, many diseases. Uh, so early uh, signature of uh, many diseases can be uh, assessed through nano sensing systems. So biosensors uh, and miniaturized devices, which can be implanted inside the body, which will sense uh, these uh, early signatures of diseases are already in market. And uh, uh, it is uh, almost all these are made through the uh, inventions that are happening in the field of nanotechnology. And the second part, imaging. So in sensing plus imaging, uh, we make it sure that uh, we can have better tools for diagnosis. And the second major part is the drug delivery as well as drug formulation. A lot of such nano drug formulations are already there in market. Nano vaccines are there. Even Pfizer itself is a nano vaccine. So it is used for coverage, you all know. Uh, so uh, the role of nanotechnology is not just limited to the drug delivery. Nowadays, a lot of such drug formulations are there which are uh, self-programmed to be programmed delivery. So it is like it, it sends and it sends whenever it is required to deliver the, uh, uh, the um, uh, drug in what quantity. So in appropriate quantity, according to the feedback and sensing mechanism, it can deliver the drug. That is making a lot of difference because drug accumulation can be a lot of 
uh, uh, to a great extent, we can avoid the, the accumulation and we can give the program delivery for the rest. So, uh, and uh, uh, target return delivery is another thing which can be site specific. So, we need not bother about the off target effects a lot when we are uh, focusing the drug to the specific location. So, target drug delivery uh, is uh, the second aspect of this. Programmed drug delivery is a sensing complete feedback based uh, control of the drug delivery is the second uh, aspect. So, we have uh, two different aspects for the drug delivery uh, where nanotechnology can offer a lot. So, then regenerative medicine. So, this is the last one. Uh, it is uh, not at uh, patient level, but it is uh, completely uh, uh, simulated by uh, nano mediated uh, uh, SIRNA as well as CRISPR based silencing tools can work very well uh, in regenerative medicine. So it can repair, it can silence, and uh, that will be a very big uh, therapeutic strategy for the next generation. So, where all it can offer a lot more because uh, you can see. It can have other kind of therapeutic strategies where uh, we can uh, kill the cancer the cells through hyperthermia. Hyperthermia means increase of temperature. So we can use the nanoparticles and increase the temperature of that particular region and kill those cells. It is called hyperthermia. And we have two different types of hyperthermia uh, which can um, happen. Um, one through the magnetic hypothermia, second is through the IR based hypothermia. So, two different approaches are there, even uh, narrow uh, mediated hypothermia. So, in magnetic hypothermia, uh, you might have heard about hysteresis loss. So, in each cycle of magnetization, energy loss is there. So, when we are applying a very high AC modulating field, we will be able to raise the temperature of the cells by 5 to uh, 6 degrees Celsius, which will selectively kill that particular cells. So, it is uh, having um, a site specific hypothermia. Uh, we can target the nanoparticles to that side location, just like here, the human is there. We can give alternative magnetic fields and uh, apply the super paramagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles, is widely used for this purpose. So the nanoparticles will get accumulated here and we can apply uh, the alternating magnetic fields of several kilohertz here because of the uh, kilohertz of applications, uh, the hysteresis loss will happen and temperature will go as well to be 6 degrees Celsius, which will kill the cell uh, selectively. So uh, it's a size specific hypothermia and uh, the same can be uh, applied to the IR based hypothermia where we can have uh, a material which is having higher absorption rate will be injected into the uh, site specific uh, region and uh, we will be able to uh, use uh, this strategy with the IR range. So that kind of hypothermia also. So, uh, and for other applications, so uh, we will be able to uh, uh, selectively uh, Yes, modify the surface. So surface modification is very important because this uh, surface modification, what are the materials, a lot of materials are being used for modifying the surface. Generally, we pour the nanoparticle surface with, which can selectively go and attach to that particular selective site. Just for example, if it's a breast cancer cell, uh, it's a, uh, it's a sort of for folate receptor. So uh, we pot our nanoparticles with the folic acid. Just like that, we will be able to selectively uh, tune the surface and modify the surface in accordance with the required uh, site. So a site specific surface modification is the nano engineering part. So it is uh, basically making our nanomaterial suitable for these particular applications. So we can use it for MRI imaging, we can use it for magnetic hypothermia, and we can uh, use it for combined uh, uh, bimodal imaging. So it can, uh, this shows uh, how magnetic nanoparticles can be used both for imaging as well as hypothermia and drug delivery. So three things are happening together and we can use the same set of nanoparticles for all these. So uh, that is why it is uh, very much important. So it's already uh, in use. So these are in clinical use already. And this shows the overall applications. Mainly, we are using uh, superparamagnetic ion oxide or gold nanoparticles widely because of its uh, uh, high compatibility. So, why, when we using nanomaterials for uh, bio applications, we have to make it sure that uh, the nanoparticles will not interact 
with the cells in the family. So uh, biocompatibility is the first way we have to assess before using those nanoparticles for any of the technology applications. So this shows the different strategies. So nanoparticles, if they have multifunctional applications, it, if, if it can sense something, it can uh, uh, it, it can it can have sensing applications. If it has got um, uh, fluorescence, it can have imaging applications. The same material, it can have some of the uh, applications in drug formulation and uh, drug delivery. It can use that particular material, a multi-functional uh, material, which can sense, which can image, and which can carry the drug and give that in site-specific locations. So that is the uh, kind of research uh, that is in progress. And the same set of nanoparticles by properly modifying the surface, we will be able to make it sense, make it fluorescent, make it uh, useful for programmed drug delivery on site specific target. So that is why that particular part is uh, highly interesting for uh, the biotechnologists as well as medicine field. So it shows the imaging and it can have diarrhea based photodynamic therapy. So the hyperthermia based therapy. So it can image, it can do the uh, healing itself. So both imaging, both sensing and healing uh, is happening together. And we can uh, load the cancer drugs also here so that uh, the selecting drug delivery also can happen with the same set of materials. We need not use multi uh, materials for sensing, imaging, etc. We can use the same material. But with a little bit uh, tailoring of the surface, we will be able to use it for different purposes. That is where uh, the nanotechnology has loads to offer. So again, it shows uh, the sensing uh, applications of gold nanoparticles. And uh, it can have immediate applications, therapy, drug delivery. So how it is modified, that is why it is important. So it can deliver drug, it can deliver protein, it can deliver the genetic materials, it can deliver the uh, uh, CRISPR, it can deliver the SIRNA, so a lot of things we can uh, by uh, making the nanoparticles engineered in such a way. So that is why nano engineering of material has a lot of applications. So, it can have therapeutic application, uh, radiation therapy, thermal therapy, photodynamic therapy, uh, and then magnetic hyperthermia based therapy, a lot of therapeutic applications. So it, it, it itself can act as a therapeutic agent and it can carry drugs. It can carry uh, drugs and deliver to the site specific location and it can act as a, a programmable drug delivery agent also. So that is why it uh, has got uh, a lot of applications. So uh, this is a, a slide which summarizes everything that I have been speaking uh, at this time. So uh, it shows uh, how we will be able to use a gold nanoparticles or any other nanoparticles which is having fluorescence in the visible range. That is why I'm speaking more about gold because it has got a lot of applications. Gold nanoparticles are highly biocompatible and it has got fluorescence in visible range and it has got absorption in the visible range. It has got sensing potential in visible range. So, and uh, it has got a, a surface class one resonance which is in the uh, uh, IR range, which can be used for photodynamic therapy. No, so, a lot of applications are there. But nowadays, because of the higher cost of the gold nanoparticles, people are working for materials which is having similar properties or better properties, tailoring of uh, 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 other material uh, which can have these light properties of gold. So, a uh, lot of new materials are being developed in this range. So now coming to the research work in our group. So we are focusing mainly on uh, nanovectors for therapy and imaging. So uh, a lot of imaging probes are being developed in our lab, uh, uh, which, which can selectively image cancer cells or selectively uh, can work as a cellular thermometer. One paper was published in that uh, angle. And uh, in another paper, we have demonstrated the skills of some particular nanoparticles uh, for imaging intracellular organelles uh, selectively. So, pH based imaging of intracellular organelles. So, these kind of applications we are focusing. And uh, 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 some other uh, angle like uh, materials for cell guidance and then uh, controlled uh, drug delivery. We are working on uh, some nano drug formulations. One paper is already published in that with nano uh, mediated drug delivery uh, for uh, viral diseases. So viral as well as cancer, uh, we are working on that. So this uh, general idea all, I already have given about the uh, nanovectors of therapeutic agents. A lot of applications are there and a uh, lot of such information can be uh, obtained from uh, different um, uh, uh, 
uh, articles. Uh, nowadays, uh, people are working with uh, liposomes uh, and nanoparticle surface, it is modified with different kinds of liposomes. And then uh, we can modify the nanoparticles with antibodies uh, and make them site specific. And a uh, load of other uh, mechanisms for surface engineering of nanoparticles like muscles, then drivers, then uh, we have self conjugated polymers, plug follow polymers, etc., which are highly biocompatible, which can have cellular guidance, and which can have other applications like uh, at a particular pH only the surface cells will just collapse and release the drug. It can form different layers of polymers, and the surface layer will be pH sensitive. At a particular pH only, that particular uh, shell will break and release the drug. So, pH specific delivery of drugs, we can selectively use those particular uh, materials. So, a lot of such engineering aspects, uh, promising uh, engineering aspects are available for uh, making such materials, which, are, uh, which can be used for these applications. For imaging, of course, the material should have a few reasons that the minimum criteria. So, generally, uh, we use gold, but in our uh, lab, we have developed copper nanoparticles of six nanometers, which is very small, very tough to make because copper is prone to oxidation. So, uh, we have selectively uh, uh, functionalized the copper nanoparticle surface in such a way that uh, its oxidation was prevented. And that uh, was through, a, 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 through an amino acid, glutathione. So, we surface functionalized uh, the copper nanoparticles with glutathione, which showed a very good. Uh, fluorescence in the visible range. So we use GSH, the glutathione capped carbon nanoclusters uh, for imaging. This shows uh, uh, the imaging potential of these. And we have used those uh, sealed GSH nanoparticles for imaging uh, the tumor. So this was uh, the tumor imaging as well as the treatment uh, because it is loaded with the drugs. That is why I told you. It's a com combination strategy. It can image and it can treat because it is uh, added to the drug. So a nano drug formulation is there and the same uh, material is fluorescent so that it can image also. So we can have uh, imaging as well as uh, fluorescence. Uh, uh, so we can load the drug with the same material which is fluorescent. So with a little bit of surface modification. So it's all applied to the surface. So this uh, this is a, a research that uh, Professor Tim Larson was uh, talking about. So, uh, for sensing nanomaterials as known to us, because uh, nanomaterials have uh, potential to sense many things, gas yeah, sensing, uh, the hypoxia sensing, and it can sense uh, the uh, stress mechanisms, it can sense the pressure, it can sense the BP. So, uh, you know about apple bars and all other steps, which I will come to that uh, later. So, all these are. Uh, um, Sensing mechanisms can be developed to use it. A single strip based sensor can be uh, made as an integrating sensor for sensing all these. BP, pulse, uh, heart rate, all this can be sensed using a simple strip for a chip, which is which can be planted in the skin surface. So, such developments are being happening. And this is uh, a sensor which is developed in our lab. It's a medic medical sensor which can detect the sodium uh, in uh, the blood, urine, and sweat. So uh, this got recently published in scientific reports, and uh, this shows the selectivity of that particular sensor. It shows uh, high selectivity. We tested in 22 different cathode systems, and you could see that only it is responding only to the sodium because while detecting sodium, the interfering species are uh, potassium and calcium, and here uh, we didn't have any such interference. So, uh, so here it shows uh, high selectivity for sodium, and uh, we developed the slips. These, these were the uh, news, uh, uh, and Azo Nano also uh, recommended that as a very good invention, which happened in the area of sensing. And uh, it got us uh, 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 highlights in uh, nature recently, the sensor which can uh, detect uh, sodium levels. And we are in the uh, uh, developmental stage for the glucose like uh, electronic part also we are trying to add to that. Here it is a sensor system which is a strip uh, which will sense uh, based on the color that it means colorimetric detection but uh, uh, right now we are modifying that for electronic um, uh, detection uh, which is giving digital uh, output uh, just like a glucometer. So uh, this, uh, this is uh, showing the calibration curve based on which we will be uh, making the electronic part. 
This is another such example in the copper pH has reversible fluorescent uh, pH sensor. pH, a cellular pH can be measured um, uh, for, uh, and we will be able to uh, uh, understand the cellular pH using this CUPSH uh, from because it's a fluorescent one. And this shows the fluorescent based uh, sensing of cancer cell. So this shows uh, the uh, uh, normal and uh, uh, cancer cells, what will be the difference in fluorescence uh, based on the CUGSH uh, based uh, prop. So here, uh, the PS was specifically altered by paclomycin. So uh, when uh, we have uh, a, a lower pH, we will be able to uh, see uh, the fluorescence. So uh, that is how selectively we will be able to see, uh, be able to image uh, the cancer cells. Uh, through the uh, uh, pH based sensing mechanism. So it can have applications like nano thermometer, nano pH sensing device. A lot of things uh, uh, can be done in cellular level. But uh, uh, the higher level, uh, just like if it is implantable inside the uh, uh, living body, what will happen? We will have to see. So it's all in uh, uh, development of stage. So this is another sensor which is developed in our lab, if, uh, which can sense homocysteine. So it's another uh, important uh, amino acid. So uh, we will be able to uh, sense a homocysteine in trace amounts, uh, just like nanomolar concentration of homocysteine can be um, uh, effectively understood based on the uh, electrochemical assays. So. This is another, uh, um, sensor which is developed in our lab, which can sense gaseous ammonia. So another uh, 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 paper which is published in Sensors and Activities. Uh, this is again based on copper, but the surface is different. So that is why I told you. With the same material, we can just play with the surface and make them sense. What is happening? Sopna has disappeared. She is okay. I think uh, Sopna's connectivity is gone. Sopna's connectivity is gone. Sopna's connectivity is gone. She is gone. She is gone. That's where she is gone. She might come back. Okay. okay. Oh, oh, oh. Wait for some time. Very bad. Dr. Anish. Yes, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Can you can you check uh, what has happened to? Yeah, yeah, yeah.
I'm sorry, uh, Sopna tells me that uh, her connectivity, Wi Fi connectivity is lost. That's for the entire university. So she's trying to get in through Geo. So maybe she may come live uh, within about five minutes time. So sir, we will wait for Dr. Sapna. Uh, no, we will wait. She 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 is coming back. So she's trying with okay, the okay, right, right. Uh, her, uh, her the other connection. If fluent I to partner did it, we will wait for something. Oh uh, yeah, we will we'll, yeah. uh, complete it. Dr. Anish? I have talked to uh, Ramesh. I have ah. talked to Sopna. Okay. Okay. She says that uh, the Wi Fi of the entire campus is gone. Oh, so okay. she is trying with um, uh, her geo connection and probably she may come. Ah. Or else, what we will wait for two, three minutes more and we will ask. Yes, sir, Dr. Anish is also from the same campus in Alisare. Okay. He okay. may have some no. other connection. But, okay. No, no, same campus, but I am in the. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Now we, we will wait for two, three minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then, uh, uh, Dr. Anish, you are ready, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No issue. Please call him. Uh, oh, if but, he's not in a position to come, we will call him. Yes, sir. Uh, GMNI, sir, we, you have to call Sopnya and say we have I to. Call her. Yeah. Call her. Yes, yeah, yeah. She's trying another connection. We can wait for two, three minutes. Yes, this is the difficulty with the uh, online connection. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Ah, you come back. Okay. Uh, coming back. Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Back. So, trying with my mobile hotspot. No, okay, no, 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 you go ahead. Yeah.
So this shows, uh, I'm sorry for the interruption uh, because of the bad Wi-Fi connection uh, here. So uh, this was the uh, calorimetric sensor uh, which can sense uh, ammonia, gaseous as well as uh, gaseous as well as liquid form it can detect the ammonia. It is by modification of the copper nanoparticle surface with system. So same copper particle, we can make it sense different materials by properly modifying its surface. So surface engineering is the most key aspect in designing the nanomaterials for sensing as well as targeted drug delivery or such specific uh, drug delivery. So uh, this also was published in Sensors and Actual Sensor Journal recently. So now I'm coming to the latest uh, uh, forecasted uh, uh, application of uh, such uh, sensing mechanism. So maybe in uh, next uh, five years or even next two years time, we can expect uh, chips. So this is a biochem chip, uh, which is showing how we will be able to uh, detect uh, the, um, uh, the PSA antigen levels. So this shows uh, three cantilevers. So it got it with three different antibodies and it is uh, exposed to PSA. So uh, you can see this cantilever only bends. So using the laser-based feedback mechanism, we will be able to see how much bending is there for all these. And based on that, we will be able to say, uh, this is a, a signature which is left there. So we will be able to say which kind of PSA1, PSA2, PSA3, PSA4, different, type, different types of antibody we will be able to uh, caught with, and then we will be able to see the presence of those different antigens. So it is a multiplex diagnostic kit, which, which is a very small nano uh, chip. Um, it shows like a very big one. These are nano chips. So it can be uh, implanted directly and we will be able to get a feedback based mechanism based on the uh, laser, which can be operated from outside. And it can use the same thing uh, in um, uh, non-implantable uh, form also. So both are uh, in principle, uh, uh, it will work. So such uh, developments will happen soon. Uh, uh, so maybe we can expect earlier uh, the concepts to uh, the realistic relief. It used to uh, take 10 to 20 years. Now it is faster. Now in two to five years time, all these uh, simulated things is coming into the lab scale as well as uh, implementation scale. So we can expect all these in coming to three years time. So multiplex diagnostics is the next promising thing which will be a diagnostics of multiple diseases together. And uh, this shows a uh, hypoxia sensor which is developed in our lab based on copper two other clusters. So, uh, uh, and another uh, recent advancement is uh, uh, the uh, engineering of carbon nanotubes such as for peptide delivery, SIR delivery, and CRISPR uh, deliveries for genetic engineering. So, the drug delivery it can be summarized like this we can have different types of uh, drug uh, delivery mechanisms. We can uh, use the nanoparticle and then we can make uh, a different a layer for the nanoparticle. We can hold the drug. And we can protect Dr. Ramesh. Hi, sir. 
uh, I think there is again problem. We will uh, wait, yes. uh, uh, but then we will not wait. Uh, I think uh, we'll, we can proceed. We can with with Dr. And uh, maybe at the end, uh, uh, when the, she comes. We can uh, have a discussion after this session. We can have a discussion with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Anish, are you ready? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, the Dale view, yes. please start with Dr. Anish. Dale view. Yeah, please, Dr. Dina. Uh, we will have uh, the lecture by uh, Dr. Anish. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Now let's invite Dr. Priyan Anish, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics, Central University of Kerala, for our next session uh, to talk on a 2D material and its applications. I heartily welcome you, sir. So good morning all. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Professor D.M. Nair sir and other members of the Kerala Academy of Sciences and uh, Dr. Shaichu and Dr. Dino of Dale College of Pharmacy and other organizers for giving this particular opportunity to be a part of this particular this event. And uh, in the first session, Dr. Sapna has started giving a, uh, some teaser about uh, nanomaterials and some of its applications. And uh, here I am planning to give some little bit more about this nanotechnology world. Then the talk will be mainly about a class of materials and that we call it as two dimensional materials. And I will be talking some of its applications. And uh, my group at Central University of Kerala is also working on the, uh, on this particular, on this type of materials. And uh, so I will show you some of the recent works in this direction from our group as well. So let me share my screen first. So I think you can see my presentation. Yeah, put it in the presentation mode than that. Okay, yeah. fine, fine, good. Okay. okay. So the two dimension materials and uh, its application and the topic is like that. So before going to the details of the two dimensional material, let us consider something about this, what is in which is contact confinement. So what about these two, um, so three dimension material, two dimension material, one dimension material, zero dimension material. So the, uh, a material is said to be three dimension or a bulk semiconductor bulk material if the carriers or the electrons or poles can move in all three dimension freely and such material now maybe we call it as the 3D materials or the bulk semiconductor or bulk materials. So, but if you confine the material to one dimension to some nano size, then such material we call it as two dimensional structures or quantum well structures. And on the other hand, if you confine the semi or material into two dimension, so in nan into nano material, nano size, such materials or such dimension materials, we call it as quantum wire structures. And if you confine all the three uh, material into all three dimensions to nano, nano size and such material, we call it as the quantum down structures. So as a result of this confinement and the material property which is a different from that of the bulk and uh, the, uh, the density of that is, that is that energy states available for these electrons and holes to occupy and that will also change. And these are the typical density of states for different uh, uh, confined systems. One is a three-dimensional system, two-dimensional system, one-dimensional system, and zero-dimensional system. So when you reduce this thing and the band gap, band gap is nothing but the separation between the valence band and conduction band of the uh, material. So that will also vary with this type of confinement. So normally when you consider the bulk material, you can see a, there is a continuous valence band and continuous uh, conduction band. And that will break into some discrete energy levels, so one by uh, level by level structures. And as a result of this, you can see uh, uh, remarkable properties in this type of material. So coming to these two-dimensional materials, so what are two-dimensional materials? The two-dimensional materials are similar to that of the one-dimension confined system. So that means the electrons or holes can move in only in two dimensions freely. The other two dimensions is motion is actually confined. So it cannot move very freely. So that type of material, we call it as two dimension materials. Also the material pass, uh, in the con that material consists of atomic layers or single or 
some few layers of atoms so uh, so that uh, the electrons in this atom cannot move in this direction freely so these uh, in these type of structures consist the uh, a one atom thick or few atom thick crystals and in which the the atoms inside that particular plane or the indra uh, the indra inner indra layer uh, atoms are connected by means of uh, some strong covalent band or ionic bond whereas the the layer uh, layer by layer interaction will be actually the weak inter wall forces so because of these weak wonder wall forces you can easily pull out one layer from the, uh, these bulk materials and uh, finally you will end up with the one mono layer or a few layers of uh, materials and such materials we call it as the two dimensional materials so that means you have a two dimension one dimension confinement in the system so because of this confinement and the material will be um, the properties will be different from that of the bulk phases and uh, you can see um, um, a lot of other properties uh, than that of the bulk materials so the history says that uh, so many years we thought that the human cannot uh, run a mile under 4 minutes so but in 1954 you can see that barrier was broken by roger banister and two months later australia's john landy also did it but now it's a common thing so similarly and uh, we thought uh, based on thermodynamics we cannot uh, take single layer of atoms you uh, cannot make a single layer of atoms but in 2010 the two great scientists that is andre jim and novoslo and they are uh, researchers at the university of manchester they obtained a single layer of graphene by using a single technique called scotch tape exfoliations so uh, when they send these uh, papers or their discovery to some of the uh, one of the prime uh, journal called nature and uh, it was rejected twice and in one of the reviewers said that the isolating stable two dimensional material was impossible and one of the other reviewers said uh, this discovery has no uh, has no scientific advances in it so but in uh, again this uh, researchers they send this paper to some of the, uh, the other uh, one of the premier journal that is science and they got accepted in that uh, paper uh, in the science journal as well and uh, for the discovery of these two dimensional systems or the graphene uh, materials they got this grant gim and novos over they were awarded with the nobel prize in physics and now you can see the you uh, even at the U university of manchester the british government has invested 60 million dollars to create this national plan uh, graphene institute and in 2013 the eu the european union is uh, awarded with uh, around 1.3 billion euro to grant this graphene flagship programs so even in our kerala and uh, in two months back the our government has also declared to start a graphene institute graphene innovation center and so the world of 2d materials are hot so now you can see there are a lot of companies fabricating uh, this type of uh, um, these uh, graphene commercially and uh, so what are the advantages of these two dimensional materials over the traditional materials like gallium arsenic and silicon so the major property is that you can vary the band gap or the, you have a wide range of band gap from for example the you have a metal insulator and semiconductor there are class of materials so these two dimensional materials consist of um, um, uh, that uh, metals insulator and semiconductor so you have a wide range of materials in this in this class itself so another thing is that since it is connected by I means these layers are connected by means of weak inter wall forces uh, it's already there there's a weak bond between these two layers so there is uh, so when you fabricate a devices or something like a led or lasers you need to bother about this lattice constants of these layers so in order to get a perfect device also if you want to get a very good light from the led you will consider or you need to make consider the materials having same lattice constants so but here there is no uh, point to uh, take care of that because uh, already it is in a weak bond so otherwise if there is any weak bond or if there is any uh, lack um, uh, lattice mismatch this there you will uh, the light you will not get enough light or enough output from the devices so this is actually uh, you can overcome and you can neglect in this type of two dimensional materials 
So since it is atomically thin and uh, it interacts very uh, differently with this light and uh, very strongly with this light, and uh, since it has a lot of wide range of band gap from metals to insulators, you can it interact with the electromagnetic spectrum in, in a wide range. So these are the different class of materials. We have insulators, semi-metals, superconductors, metals, semiconductor, everything. All class of materials are in these uh, two-dimensional structures itself. So that. Uh, so the first materials that uh, the two great scientists, Kim and Novoso, got our uh, Nobel Prize in, uh, for this particular discovery of this particular class of materials called graphene. So graphene is actually a two-dimensional allotrope of these carbon atoms. So it's just like a layer of carbon atom or one or two few like mono layers of carbon atom. So such that means the two-dimensional allotrope of carbon we call it as graphene, and whereas the three-dimensional we call it as graphite. And uh, when you come come to the one-dimensional structures, that we call it as the carbon nanotube. And uh, in the zero-dimensional case, we call it as the fullerenes or bulky boards. So we are uh, interested in this particular class of material that is two-dimensional material that is graphene. So what you are going to write, suppose um, um, your Pencil is actually a, a, a bulk material and a graph that is actually consists of graphite. So when you're writing on the paper, you are actually deposing in think some few layers of graphene into the your paper. So this is actually the layers of graphene atoms or, or the carbon atoms. And these each layer or a mono layer of carbon atom, we normally call it as the graphene layers. Okay. So how do we make this type of graphene? So there are, for this particular method, we got, and they got the Nobel Prize. That is a very easy technique. So you take a graphite material, sorry, the bulk material, sorry, the uh, big material. And by using this cost step, you can peel off different layers from this graphite. Okay, so finally you will end up with one or few, uh, few layers of uh, uh, that's carbon atoms. And that we call it as the graphene. And this is a typical uh, the electron microscopy picture of that particular graphene. So um, um, since it is connected by means of weak Van der Waals forces, you can easily pull, uh, pull off this particular uh, each layers from this uh, graphite la uh, materials. Finally, you will end up with a single or few layers of carbon atoms. Okay. So after getting, so for example, after getting some materials, how one can characterize this uh, type of materials? Okay, so that is the next question. So once you fabricate or once you get this type of material, we can identify the material, whether it is uh, your graphene or some other material uh, by looking upon the structure. And one of the techniques we call it as the X-ray diffractions. So X-ray diffractions are nothing but uh, so when the X-ray beams, when it falls on some uh, some crystals. So crystals are concerns of uh, 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 layers of atoms. So that means atomic planes. So atoms are arranged in a particular plane. So you can see um, infinite number of atomic planes and they are separated by a distance. We call it as interatomic spacing. So D is the spacing. So this is the first layer of atom and this is the second layer of atom and this is the third layer of atom. So when the X-ray falls on these particular things and, and it will diffract from or diff it will reflect from this uh, crystal surface and you will get a, uh, a different pattern uh, by depending upon the conditions, the uh, Bragg's law, that is 2D sine theta is equal to N lambda. So when the uh, condition, when uh, the X-ray beam satisfies this particular condition, you will get a peaks in the spectra. Otherwise, you will not get any peak. So based on this, you will get some structure. And so, uh, so this is the X-ray angle. So X-ray is incident at a particular angle theta, and the, but the detector is taking an angle of two theta. So if you take an angle, uh, if you take a plot between two theta, that is the angle between this detector and the intensity, you will get a spectra like this. So this is the spectra normally uh, uh, you will get. So when you compare this spectra with the standard data or JCPDS data, and uh, there are so many uh, 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 data in available in uh, the so when you compare with the standard data, you can identify whether the material is the uh, corresponding material, for example, if it is a zinc uh, uh, oxide or whatever it is, or copper, whatever it is. So you can identify whether your material is same or not. And for example, this is the standard data, and if you are getting a peak here, but in the standard data, there is no peaks. So you can say that that is an impurity in the system. Okay. So in that way, you can identify the material, and from the width of the peak, you can identify the crystallite size. So many parameters you can identify, but I'm not going to the details of that thing. 
And uh, now how one can see these nanostructures. So there are uh, eyes, you can see a little up to some certain limit and uh, with the optical limit, uh, optical microscope, you can see a, um, um, up to 100 micrometer or 200 micrometer regime. But our size of the nanostructure is below that of uh, this particular 100 nanometer. So you need some other techniques. So, so for that, you need some electron beams to form these uh, materials. So people are using the scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope that is the SEM and TEM for the, uh, for the imaging of these uh, nanostructures. So these are the, some of the uh, SEM or uh, images of the, some of the nanostructures. Okay, now coming to this graphene again, and graphene is actually the strongest material and you can see that uh, it is four times stronger than the diamond and it is four times stronger than the steel and uh, it is uh, uh, having a lightweight system and uh, uh, its weight is around 0.77 milligram per meter squares and it is flexible so you can fabricate a flexible devices and now people are more interested in that type of flexible devices and uh, so graphene has a spring constant of this much and uh, an Eng's constant as well uh, of 0.05 uh, terapascal and um, uh, then it has a transparency of 98%. So it is very transparent to the light, visible light. So it is electric, actually electrically conductive as well and as well as uh, thermally conductive as well. So it has a lot of properties and uh, because of that, people started uh, exploring its uh, application, uh, the application with these particular materials. So you can see a lot of applications. One of the major uh, um, breakthrough is that you can change these commonly used uh, transparent and conduct, transparent conducting oxides. So that means ITO is the or indium tin oxide that is the commonly used transparent conducting oxide. So that means uh, at the same time it is transparent and uh, it is conducting as well. So these type of materials, this ITO is indium uh, in, that contains uh, indium that is very scarce and very uh, um, uh, very. Uh, expensive as well, so you cannot use for large uh, quantity. Um, so people started uh, searching for other alternatives. So graphene is actually we found that is a very ninety-eight percent is transparent and is very conductive. So you can actually replace this IPO with this graphene, and people started working on this, and uh, they fabricated some devices out of this. And this is a typical graphene-based um, organic LED. Or similarly, you can fabricate the touch screens, uh, liquid crystal displays, photovoltaic devices that is solar cells and etc. Because of these high conductivity and a high transparency. So this is a particular uh, uh, schematic of this particular uh, uh, organic LED. So you can see that is this organic uh, light emitting layers. This is the active layer and which is sandwiched between a uh, one electrode that is a cathode. Normally we take the aluminum or silver depending upon the band gap position and band edge position. So, and another here we have taken the graphene. So you can see that the, uh, in, um, the cathode normally we take a, a silver or aluminum so that is actually opaque to the system. So uh, you will not get the light through this particular window because of the uh, um, opaque nature of the aluminum and silver. So the only way you to can take uh, the light or light generated in the organic layer is through this particular way. And uh, since it is graphene is transparent, you can take this light through this window. And at the same time, you can give the electric connection using this graphene and other electrode. Okay. So another uh, thing is that we um, can see these photovoltaic cells that is in solar cells as well. Uh, uh, people are using this graphene. So this is a typical structure of a solar cells. So uh, it consists of a P3 HTP CBN that is the active material of the solar cells and there are other layers for some uh, transport layers are there. But uh, here also you can see that is that aluminum. Aluminum is the electrode we have, they have taken and here it is graphene. So there are two electrodes. One is aluminum and another one is the graphene. So here you can see that uh, the aluminum is opaque, so the light cannot enter to the active material. So this way the light can enter through the glass, graphene, and pure PS is also a transparent material. So finally, this light will reach at the P3 HTP CBM, where the light will split into electrons and holes, and the electrons and holes will move to in one direction. Electron will move in one direction, and holes will move in the other direction. So electrons and move will be separated out, and that will act as the current. So the solar cell is nothing but a conversion of the light energy into the uh, carriers or the current. So um, uh, since it is the graphene is uh, transparent, so the light can enter to the active region through this graphene, that is transparent graphene. 
And the, this is a complete transparent devices. You can see ITO is a transparent, sync offset is a transparent, and uh, graphene is also transparent. Redox PS is a, a transparent. So the light can enter through this region as well as this region. So you will get more light into the active region and you, um, more electron can hold by uh, hold, you will get, and uh, naturally you will get more current in the system. So that is the advantage of these type of systems. And uh, this is a typical structure of a solar cells. So, now, even though the, uh, the graphene has this much of applications and this much of properties, and uh, but it lacks one of the major properties that is that graphene has no band gap. The band gap means there is no separation between valence band and conduction band. So that is actually uh, the main drawback of this graphene material. And uh, why uh, it is, is a drawback means you cannot make any transistors. So in your devices, most of the devices like uh, the computers, uh, mobile phone, all, almost all the electronic devices, you can see the number of transistors are actually behind this uh, operation. Okay, so uh, this transistor is actually uh, switching on and switching off your devices. Okay, each pixel, for example, now you're talking about 48 MP megapixel of your uh, uh, camera or uh, some like that whatever the 16 MB, 21 MB pixel or something like that. That each M micro pix that pixel is actually controlled um, by the each transistors. So is this transistor is uh, whether if it is switch on means you are getting the light, otherwise you will not get any light. So this actually the transistor is controlling your each and every component in your devices. So, but you cannot make this transistor with this graphene because uh, uh, since uh, it has no band gap, the electrons are always in the conduction band or it is always in the conducting stage. So you cannot switch off the system. So that is a major drawback of this graphene system based system. Another drawback is that single sheet of graphene, that, that's a single mono layer of carbon atom is very difficult to produce. And there are, you need more new and very costly equipment for, for the fabrication of this graphene. And uh, it is also uh, when it's uh, susceptible to the oxidative environment, that is also a disadvantage. So people uh, start uh, thinking about other type of materials and uh, start discovering uh, new types of materials similar to this class or layered light structures. And there are different class of materials that is a graphene that has a band gap of zero and another one hexagonal boron nitrate, transition metal dichycogenides black phosphorus, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many class of materials, we call it as uh, 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 in this uh, two-dimensional system. So beyond graphene, people start thinking, uh, uh, people start thinking about uh, material beyond graphene. So graphene lacks this band gap and this it is suit, uh, not suitable for digital electronic application. So there are non-graphene layered compounds that is boron nitrate um, so many metal chalcogenides, oxides, hydroxide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are some of the materials. And um, here I am talking about a class of materials, two-dimensional materials. We call it as the transition metal dichalcogenides. And it has a particular structure MX2, where M is a transition metal under the green, the, the material, uh, the elements which is marked in the green color, and X is a chalcogen. So these are these are the materials. So uh, by making different composition, you will get a transition metal dichalcogenate which are having a structure of MX2. So this is a, uh, there are different um, composition you can, com uh, combination you can see that is niobium sulfide, niobium selenide, niobium telluride, and uh, tantalum, molybdenum, the tungsten, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different, uh, here itself you can see the, some of them are metals, some of them are semiconductors, some of them are insulators, etc. So you can see almost all the properties in this class itself. So two dimension materials. So here I am presenting in the two dimension system, one of the class of material, one class of material, they call it as molybdenum disulfide material. So this is also a two dimension systems in which you can see that uh, an hexagonally arranged MO atom, that is molybdenum atom, which is sandwiched between, so the black color is actually the molybdenum atom, which is, that is hexagonally arranged and which is sandwiched between two planes of hexagonally arranged sulfur atom. So the yellow color is actually the sulfur atom. So you have a hexagonal system here and a hexagonal system. So in between there is an MO system as well. So this constitute a single mono, uh, the layer of um, MOS2. Okay. So these, you can see this MO and uh, the, there is a strong covalent bond between this MO and sulfur. So uh, these atoms are very strongly connected by means of the strong covalent bond, whereas 
these layers, so this is the first layer and this is the second layer, they are connected by means of a weak Van der Waals process. So this is actually weak in nature. So you can easily pull off one layer from the uh, material. So that is the advantage of this type of material or layered type of material or two dimension material. Okay. So depending upon, I um, mean, this MO used to have two different structures. That is one is high, just hexagonal structure. Another one is an octahedral structure. And uh, this has two different properties as well. So in the hexagonal structure, this is a semiconductor in nature, and whereas the uh, other one, this uh, uh, tetragonal or octahedral structure has a metallic in nature. So these are the two structures uh, exist in uh, MOS2. And uh, uh, now coming to the concept of band gap, I already mentioned that the, uh, the band gap is nothing but the separation between balance band and conduction band. Now you can see this is a, 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 a class of material we call it as direct band gap semiconductors or direct band gap material. It means that the, this is actually the valence band. So this bottom curve is we call it as a valence band and the top curve is call it, uh, we call it as a conduction band. So they are actually the top of the valence band and bottom of the conduction band, they are in the same line. And so such material, we call it as direct band gap semiconductors. So another thing we can see that uh, this is also the bottom of the, uh, the valence band and this is the conduction band. But they are at, a, at the top of the valence band and bottom of the conduction band are at, at a different position. So such material, we call it as indirect band gap semiconductors. So by, uh, look, um, by looking at the position of the valence band and the uh, um, conduction band, you can identify whether the material is a direct band gap or indirect band material. Because in the indirect band gap material, you will not get any light. For example, here, suppose there is an electron in the uh, excited study that is in the conduction band. If it make a downward transition, suppose there is an electron here and that comes to this conduction valence band, that will liberate the extra energy in sort of some form of the light. But here you can see that if there is an electron in the conduction band, this will come to the ground state with the emission of a phonon, that is heat energy. So here you will get only heat energy, but here you will get a light energy. So when you are fabricating, a, uh, suppose if you want to fabricate an LED or laser, you will look for this type of materials, a direct band gap material. You cannot make any material, LED or laser with indirect band gap material because you will get only heat energy. Okay. So uh, in this class itself, for example, in the um, molybdenum uh, disulfide or MOS2, the bulk material, so this is the top of the valence band and this is the bottom of the conduction band, then they are not at the same line. So this is also a indirect band gap semiconductor. Now coming to the four layer system of MOS2, here also you can see there is a, this is not in the same line. So this is also an indirect material. But here also you can see in two layer system also it's not an indirect, it's an indirect material. But when coming to the single layer of system, that is the here you can see the top of the valence band and bottom of the conduction band are in the same line. So this is a direct band gap material. So you can convert this indirect band gap material into a direct band gap material. So that is a, one of the beauty of this particular material. Okay. So now you can see the band gap here. This is a small, uh, uh, the distance between valence band and conduction band, we call it as the band gap. Here, this is the distance is this much, and this is the distance. And you can see the distance is actually the valence band and conduction band distance is actually increasing. So the band gap actually increases with this uh, uh, decrease in layer number. Okay, so uh, that is another property. So uh, uh, this one uh, I have already mentioned, so you can convert an indirect band gap material to a direct band gap material. Now, um, uh, this one can see from the photoluminescence studies. Photoluminescence study means when you shine the uh, material with the, some sort of radiation, you will get the uh, light energy from the material. Okay, so that will emit some sort of radiations. Okay. So uh, here you can see that uh, for the two layer system, the emission is uh, very weak or there is no emission at all. But uh, here you can see for the one layer system, the emission is high. So, uh, uh, so there is a huge change in the photoluminescence when you change from the um, uh, two layer system to the one layer system. So um, uh, that actually can, uh, is a confirmation from direct band, indirect band to direct band gap. So here you can see the more number of light energy and here more of the energy will be liberated in the form of heat energy. So this is another uh, uh, spectra that showing one layer, two layer, three layer, etc. Here the spectra giving a high intensity 
uh, it's not uh, like that here the in whatever the intensity you got which is multiplied by three times it's not like uh, uh, so this is the uh, spectra for the one layer system this is for two layer system etc etc so the intensity is actually decreasing when you um, uh, uh, do, uh, when you have more layers in the system and also uh, we can see that the band gap actually increases so the band gap from uh, for the six layer uh, system means band gap is around 1.4 but uh, when you have single layer it's uh, band gap is around 1.9 electron volt so the band gap is actually increasing now coming to the uh, another uh, spec, uh, um, pro um, property, how one can detect the number of layers in the system. So by using the Raman studies or Raman spectra, you can identify the number of number of layers in the systems. So um, uh, whether it is a single layer system or two layer system, three layer or four layer like that. So uh, you can identify the Raman studies or Raman spectra will give you some modes of vibration. So the, here it is the molybdenum atom and the yellow color represents the uh, sulfur atom. So these are uh, actually the uh, it will vibrate in different uh, or, or in different way. So by depending upon the different vibration, you have identified uh, we have uh, different modes of vibration and uh, um, um, we have all these type of so this is the typical Raman spectra of the molybdenum disulfide and you can see the different vibrations now but here in this vibration itself um, we are mainly considering this particular uh, two peaks that is around 380 and 400 peaks and so these are the two peaks and you can see that where uh, there are two vibrations one is e12g and another one is a1g e12g means the sulfur atoms are vibrating in the uh, to the left side direction whereas the molybdenum atom is vibrating in the other direction so these vibrations are opposite to each other but um, whereas a1g peak corresponds to the vibration corresponds to sulfur atoms are vibrating in the opposite direction so but uh, uh, the a1g peak is this one and uh, e1g peak is this one so by looking upon the band position of this value or, or the difference between e12g and a1g you can identify the number of peaks and, uh, and the number of layers in the system so um, mainly we consider the separation between a1g and e1g e12g peak so difference between these two peaks okay so now why people are more interested in this type of uh, MOS2? So you can see that the transistors are, um, are, ma are a major component of your device, electronic devices that actually controls your ones and zeros in your devices. So, um, so uh, that means you need to make a, a transistor out of it. The transistor is actually making whether it is in the on stage, uh, whether it is in the off stage. So in order to make a good transistor, you, you it must have a, very high carrier mobility are uh, at the same time very good on off ratio that is uh, the on off ratio means that the current is the on stage to uh, divide by the current in the off stage so if you have very good on off ratio um, means there is no leakage current and the your device is perfect so in order to make this device the people have started using this mos2 because of the uh, of band gap and all the things so this is a, a concept of Moore's law so Moseslow says that actually in every year the number of transistors in your device is actually is, in the, uh, is increasing or uh, doubling. So you can see that in 1970 uh, the processor in your computer the, uh, is actually Intel 4004. So in that around 2.3 uh, 2300 uh, there were only 2300 transistors. But in the 2011 you can see that is a, your computer processors were actually that Core i7 system, and there are around 1.3 billions of uh, transistors in that particular system. That chip. So uh, that transistor, the number of transistors is very, very high and, that, and the size of the system is also very small. So that actually uh, makes your device more perfect and more, uh, more performing in these days. Uh, so in order to make a system more perfect uh, or uh, more good, uh, you need to add more transistors into the system. So, um, but uh, um, after that, you can, um, the number, you need to reduce the system to its very, very small size. So 
So, but you cannot decrease the size of the uh, material to below a certain range. Why? Because um, uh, this is a typical transistor structures. So you can here you can see this uh, source and drain, and there is your active material. So this active material is actually controlling your on off. Uh, on, means whether the transistor is uh, owning, uh, switching on or off. Because uh, when you give a current to the system, the electrons will move from here to here, and it will reach at the drain. Okay, so uh, if the thickness of this MOU2 is very, very small, means you, uh, there is no path to go uh, electron from source to drain. So that means you need a minimum thickness for this active layer MOU2, whatever the material. So, uh, but the major problem is that when you decrease the size of this active layer, uh, the mobility is actually decreasing. So if the carriers have no mobility, means the electron will cannot move to the other direct, other end. So the, that is a major drawback of this particular uh, system uh, when you use other type of semiconductors. So in, in Indian gallium arsenic and Indian arsenic, etc. So the mobility decreases when you decrease the size of the active layer. But whereas in MOS2, you can see that the mobility is almost constant. So you can fabricate this type of, uh, 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 that is the advantage of this type of two-dimensional materials of MOS2. Um, uh, so you can fabricate the transistor with this uh, MOS2 as well. So another application of the MOU2 is actually you can fabricate the solar cells as well. So this uh, typical solar uh, cell structure of P-type silicon and MOU2. So, so P-type silicon that is a P-type material and MOU2 is an N-type material. So you can have a P-N junction. So this actually uh, makes a solar cells and uh, this is a typical spe structure of uh, output device, output of characteristics of the solar cells. So another things are, um, I want to mention here, it is, and even though I mentioned several um, applications and several properties of this MOSO, how one can make this type of materials or nanomaterials. So there are two types of approaches. One is the top-down approaches as well as the bottom-up approaches. Then top-down approach means that you take a big materials and you can split into small, small particle, and finally you will end up with a small size particle. And that is your top-down approaches. Whereas the bottom-up approaches means that you take the individual atoms and you combine in a proper ratio and finally you will end up with a nano size particles okay so there are different types of MITI uh, techniques and one is a me mechanical exfoliation techniques that is the techniques that i mentioned and that is the scotch step method and that got nobel prize uh, for the uh, in 2001 and another technique is spray pyrolysis and here you can see that uh, this spray that consists of the chemicals and you can spray over to the substrate and to um, by depending upon the conditions that is uh, by depending on, by giving the proper temperature and distance and everything you can control the thickness and all the properties of these films and another one is the chemical vapor deposition here you can see the sulfur sources and the mo sources so and you can heat this chamber into very high temperature and uh, when the argon gas that is the carrier gas when it when you pass this argon gas these sulfur vapors uh, it will take this uh, the argon gas will take these sulfur vapors and uh, it, uh, finally it will reach at the mo sources and it will react and finally and then it will deposit on the substrate so in that way you can deposit the molybdenum sulfate uh, by using the chemical vapor deposition and another method is actually the hydrothermal synthesis here you take the molybdenum precursors and the sulfur precursors and uh, uh, you mix it in a proper ratio and finally you can heat it in a uh, uh, hot or flame at uh, different temperatures and uh, you will get the nanostructures of uh, mos to whatever it uh, nanostructures so uh, in our group, we did some of the uh, some works in this particular direction. So we fabricate we uh, have synthesized this MOS2 that is molybdenum disulfide using hydrothermal synthesis. Uh, yeah. So this is the uh, uh, X-ray diffraction spectrum. You can see there are uh, the star marks that represents the P, uh, some impurity peaks that is corresponds to the molybdenum oxide. So in the at 150 degree and 180 degree, you can see there are some impurity, but at 200 degrees that corresponds per, uh, to the perfect uh, MOS2 samples. So you can see that a lot of temperature, there is no, um, um, the, um, the, it contain MO3 peak, but at a high temperature, it contain MOS2. And uh, another thing, we varied that uh, time as well uh, to study the dependence of uh, duration of the uh, annealing. 
and uh, this is the scanning electron microscopic feature of this particular MOS2 samples. You can see that at six hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, and 48 hours, the size of the plates actually increases uh, with an increase in the time duration uh, ahead of them. So, and uh, here also we studied the Raman spectra, and you can see that there is a separation between A1G and E1, E1-2G, and we got uh, uh, around 25 centimeter inverse that corresponds to few layers of 5-6 uh, layer of MOS2 sample. And uh, the photoluminescence is uh, another study we carried out in our lab, and uh, that is uh, here you can see that when you excite the sample at a 440 nanometer uh, of light, you will get a peak in the higher energy range, um, means lower energy range uh, at a high wavelength state. So this is the photoluminescence spectra, and you will get a blue emission, uh, green emission, sorry, green emission when you excite with the 440 nanometer. So this is a photoluminescence spectrum, and uh, um, but uh, uh, we got an, uh, another important property in this material that is upconversion photoluminescence. That means the upconversion photoluminescence means the emitted photons have or emitted uh, uh, photons have higher energy than that of the excited photon, or the emitted uh, radiation have higher ener energy than that of the excited radiation. And this is because uh, we found that when you excite at a 390 nanometer, you are getting an emission at a 520 nanometer, 521 nanometer. But uh, this means this has 3.18 electron volt and this has very less energy. So this is a normal photoluminescence spectra, but an upconversion, uh, this is due to the um, uh, two photon absorption. So the two photon having small energy, that is 1.56 and 1.56, will absorb at the same simultaneously and it will reach at the higher excited state and finally it will come back to the ground. Um, uh, uh, the top of the particular band induction band, and from that it will come back to the energy, lower energy state, and um, it will liberate an a photon having an energy of 521. So the reason for this upconversion photoluminescence is the two photon absorption. So another thing is that uh, so that means uh, you can use this high energy photon means um, uh, the low energy photon. That means if you are normally people are not using this infrared radiation in the solar cell re, uh, application. Normally, we convert this visible light into the current. That is the normal way of using the solar cell. But normally, we discard this IR part of this solar spectra. So, but by using this type of in uh, what is that up conversion material, you can actually convert this uh, high energy, low energy photon into the uh, that is the uh, photon in this region to the in, in uh, visible region, and thereby you can improve the efficiency of the solar cell. So uh, we have also checked the magnetic property, and uh, I'm not going to talk more about this one. And uh, uh, so another uh, application that uh, uh, we did in our um, in Central University of Kerala in collaboration with the Biochemistry of Department is that we checked the uh, properties, anti angiogenic and anti cancer properties of these materials, that is MOS2 and its composites. And we have fabricated, uh, fabricated a MOS2 and zinc oxide nanocomposite, and this is a typical scanning electron microscopy feature of that. This plate corresponds to MOS2, and the particle, uh, the circular uh, particle nanoparticle uh, corresponds to the zinc oxide. So uh, this is the X-ray diffraction spectra of that sample. And we checked the uh, cytotoxicity measurements of this sample, and we found the, uh, the cytotoxicity measurements uh, in, uh, with the normal cell line with and corresponding uh, the cancerous cell lines uh, when you when it reaches with the hemoids to set and composites and uh, it's, we found that in a safety index of two and uh, later then uh, we check the sample for anti-cancer property and uh, this is the cancerous cells uh, in the um, that we check the anti-cancer property using the xenograft assay and this is the can uh, control cells and you can see uh, when it is treated with the MOS2 sample the size is actually reduced and you can see the hemoglobin content as well but uh, when you this is the sample when you treat with the zinc oxide samples and uh, here also the size is reduced and uh, here also you can see a little bit of hemoglobin content and then, but when you you can see this sample, uh, when you treat with the MOS to zinc oxide sample, you can see that uh, the size is actually reduced. Uh, the uh, cancerous uh, cell is actually uh, the size of the cancerous tissue is actually reduced. At the same time, the hemoglobin content is also very uh, re reduced. 
So uh, the, uh, this you can see from the uh, this ground, the size of the xenon cap is produced uh, when it is treated with the MO to the xenon. Uh, and, uh, and here also we have found that uh, the um, reduced vascular density as well. And uh, the same thing we checked with the MO is to and certain as well. And, um, and we found that the samples have, when it is treated with uh, this MO is to certain no, and um, it activates the caspase 3 uh, enzyme and that actually uh, that actually from, uh, results in the apoptosis process. And at the same time, it enhances the, uh, so at the same time, it down regulates the, uh, the genes corresponding to angiogenesis, pro-angiogenesis. So that actually blocks this angiogenesis uh, um, process and uh, it actually, um, um, Inhibits the you know, uh, that is epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So uh, this material is actually good material for the anti-cancer properties. So, so this is what we have sub published in the Journal of Material Chemistry B in 2018. And another thing, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, initial slide, uh, we found we mentioned that. Uh, there are two types of material. One is the hexagonal system, and another one is a tractagonal uh, system. So one is a semiconductor, and another one is a metallic system. So we checked. Uh, we uh, have also fabricated or uh, synthesized the, the uh, two types of system by using the high, um, by changing the conditions of the hydrothermal synthesis, and we got a uh, improved conductivity for the uh, one time um, one tmo is to that actually tells you the, the your sample one t system is more conductive and that. Uh, and uh, another important property of this particular, particular material is that uh, it can be used for hydrogen evolution reaction. So this hydrogen is actually considered as a, uh, is a, is a renewable energy sources and uh, you can use this material. So it's actually uh, you converts this water electro, uh, electro splitting. So in order to get this hydrogen value, um, um, hydrogen, you uh, we are doing actually the water electro splitting, and uh, for that you need a electrocatalyst. So here we have used the MOS towards the electrocatalyst, and uh, I, I, um, and having different structures. And one is a hexagonal structures, another one is the octahedral structures, and we found that the tetragonal structures are more uh, good in uh, producing the hydrogen. Uh, so uh, we have checked this uh, hydrogen evolution properties of the uh, by using these two catalysts, electro catalysts. At the same time, we checked the um, the photoluminescence properties when you when it is dispersed in different media that is ammonia, isopropyl alcohol, etc., etc. And this is a photoluminescence spectra, normal photoluminescence, and this is a upconversion photoluminescence. So, so it is clearly uh, showing um, a sensing towards the ammonia. So this can be used for detecting the ammonia uh, in the um, samples as well. So another uh, one of the other device will be fabricated by using this MOS is actually the uh, um, uh, gas, uh, gas sensors. So this is the typical spectrum of gas sensors. So we have uh, a P-type silicon substrate and on the top of that we deposited a silicon uh, dioxide. And you have two electrodes, one is from um, a, a gold electrode here and another from gold electrode here. So in between we deposit your material that is MOS2. So this is the way of depositing. So we drop cast your material there. And this is the typical device uh, device we fabricated using this type of uh, method. And after that, we check the for, um, uh, gas sensing property by depending uh, by uh, uh, taking the current from the devices. So this is a, um, uh, one of the um, uh, devices we fabricated that is a palladium topped MOS2 samples and it's showing you no know, effect to the H2S and NS3, and, but it is showing very little effects to the NO2, and, but at the same time showing very good response to the NO gases. So you can see, uh, clearly say that uh, the sensor can detect the uh, NO gases very uh, in a good manner. So that actually tell you the uh, the selectivity of your sensors. And uh, later we uh, we checked the uh, different uh, uh, sensitivity. So we varied the concentration of these uh, NO gases in different way, and we found that it's um, following a proper way. That is, uh, the current is decreasing with a decrease in the concentration. And that tells you the sensitivity of the devices. And another thing is that we checked the um, uh, performance of the devices in different intervals. Also, the, um, and um, we are getting almost similar performance. And so that gives you the stability of the devices. 
So this is the one of the devices we fabricated in the um, lab, uh, and this work we have published in the General Electrochemical Society in 2020. Okay, similar to this uh, MOS2, we have fabricated a similar uh, other class of uh, layered material that is WS2 material, and these are some of the results. And I'm not going to discuss about this one in the, I'm just uh, showing that some of the other materials are also there. So these are the um, um, plates and the nano plates of WS2, and we have also synthesized some of the uh, other layered type of material called the VS2 vanadium disulfide and you can see the flake like structures in uh, of the VS2 as well and, uh, and this is another class of material that is a uh, tin sulfate tin disulfate and SNS2 nanostructures here you can see this hexagonal structured uh, samples and uh, and uh, here um, uh, with this sns2 sample we have also fabricated a diode that is a p type silicon and n types sns2 that is a pn junction and um, and you can see that perfect diode characteristics uh, and also when it is and you shine the, uh, the samples with the, uh, with the pn junction with the light you are giving it giving some photo current as well so we have fabricated a photo diode with this uh, uh, sns2 nanostructures as well and after that uh, we checked the photocatalytic degradation of this methylene blue and uh, uh, there are uh, you can see that industrialization uh, of uh, just like industries like uh, textile industry plastic industry pesticides industry that discharges a lot of organic dyes and other pollutants uh, to the environment so when when it reaches the river and other um, environment yeah, that is actually a threat to the aquatic life and other ecosystems so we need a proper treatment for the wastewater so we uh, so we check that um, there are different method to uh, for the wastewater treatment but most of them require some secondary treatment as well as um, most of them are very expensive in nature so we checked the photocatalytic degradation so that means uh, uh, the catalyst which uh, the catalyst will absorb this light and that will convert and that will produce some free radicals and uh, and it will uh, react with this methylene blue or organic dyes and uh, finally it will be uh, decomposed into harmless product so that way we checked and uh, we used our um, uh, two dimension material for this purpose and this is a result we got uh, when it is treated with a uh, 5 milligram of vs2 and this is the methylene blue uh, photoluminous i mean absorbance so when it is treated with the 5 mg of uh, vs2 and you can see that in the uh, peak is reduced that means the methylene blue is degraded into some of um, this product so this is the mechanism that i mentioned and here also in the inside you can see the color of the uh, sample um, initially and after the treatment with the 5 mg you know vs2 the color is turned to um, pure material pure water so and we checked the properties uh, after the um, photocatalytic degradation again we took the xrd of the vs2 sample and it's giving perfect uh, xrd peak of the vs2 itself so that shows the stability of your nanomaterial even after the um, um, treatment uh, with uh, this organic dyes so and after that we did uh, several cycles as well and you can see uh, the degradation percentage is not uh, reducing that much so so if you can consider this and we used to one of the best uh, one of the best material for the photo degradation of this methylene blue and uh, so far the materials that i have mentioned is actually anti material that is mos2 ws2 vs2 sns2 all are uh, anti material uh, and you can see that uh, making an anti material is a little bit easy but making a two dimension material having p type p type conductivity is a little bit difficult so but people uh, in 2016 they have uh, developed or they have grown a two dimension Material having p-type conductivity. So this is SNO is a one of a material having p-type conductivity. So one is uh, you have now. So now there is a p-type material and a, a large num number of n-type material. So you can combine this n-type and p-type material in your own way, and you can make any different devices out of this. So that is a challenge to uh, the uh, the coming world uh, or the coming researchers. So. 
with this i am stopping and i take this opportunity to thank um, my mentor um, professor mk jayraj and currently the vice chancellor of calicut university and uh, dr t n narayanan and uh, dr samir and dr prema and dr etre and of nam and the most of the work uh, that i presented here is actually in the works of dr levana and uh, recently she got the prestigious madam curie fellowship and uh, i think last day the last day it came in the newspaper as well and, uh, and this is uh, dr levana and uh, i acknowledge all other research scholars uh, anshu and uh, kishore and other uh, students of my department and other faculties of my department and uh, thank you all so much for your thank you and thank you for the Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was an amazing informative session for us students. Again, thank you sir, for spending your valuable time with us. Now, students can ask questions. Uh, Jinder, sir. Uh, uh, a few minutes for Dr. Sopna to uh, conclude. She has a, yeah. one or two slides. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Sopna, please. Dr. Sopna, please. And thereafter, we can have a discussion or interactive session. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. please. So, uh, so I think it is better, Dr. Anish, conclude and then we can go for the Sopna. Anish has concluded. Only concluded. I know, sir. I know, if if yeah, they have any questions. Yeah. Is it audible now? And the screen is visible? Hello? Anish, screen. Uh, Dr. Anish, please uh, leave from okay. the screen. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm starting till where I stopped. So, uh, we can. Second, second. The second. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Ah, yes. Please. It is audible, yes, sir. It yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. So, um, we can uh, modify the surface uh, with uh, layers, uh, like uh, a feed sensitive uh, polymer layer, uh, so that it, it will just break uh, whenever we want. So, it is like programmable uh, break of the uh, shell uh, to release the drugs. So we can uh, make the uh, nanoparticle engineer surface engineered in such a way that we can uh, coat it with pH uh, sensitive polymers. We can coat it with uh, ligands, and we can coat it with some uh, particular material which will selectively target the, uh, the uh, biomarkers inside uh, where we want to target. So uh, this is the general strategy for surface engineering. So that makes the material uh, 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 so uh, important from the application point of view. It can sense, it can image, it can uh, go into the selective site, uh, which is uh, so specific. So uh, this shows the concept of nano red formulation. As I told, uh, if, 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 if it really wants to uh, go into the, the cell, uh, uh, inside the nucleus, if we want that to reach the nucleus, uh, we uh, need to put, um, uh, add the self penetrating peptide also into that uh, so that it can penetrate uh, the cell and go into uh, the desired location. So, this shows the quantum torch, gold quantum torch, uh, which is made in such a way that it can go and uh, reach the uh, nucleus. So this is a narrow drug formulation we have made and which shows the toxicity reduction. You can see uh, the lauric acid, which is a uh, drug uh, which is used for uh, used as an antiviral agent. So its uh, therapeutic index is very poor. Therapeutic index means its um, inhibiting concentration is 1.25 micrometer, while uh, the lethal dose for killing the 50 percent means that that shows the toxicity limit. So that is only 2.5. So, so that means if I take paracetamol 500, uh, I will get my pain relief. And if I take paracetamol 1000, I will die. So uh, that doesn't make any sense because the therapeutic index is too narrow. We will not be able to use that drug for any practical application. So we made the same drug with nanoformulation using uh, sin sulfide. Uh, and we could see that therapeutic index got enhanced a lot because 5 micrometer was the IC50 and we could uh, get the LD50 increased up to 80. That means we will be able to make the nano drug uh, less toxic with uh, the uh, nano uh, formulation. So again, in microfidolic acid, it shows uh, the same therapeutic index is there too. It's the therapeutic index. And here uh, in uh, nano drug formulation uh, with uh, six sulfide, the lauric acid, uh, the micro, sorry, this is for the microfidolic acid. Microfidolic acid shows eight and one forty. So that much big difference is a two order enhancement uh, in uh, biocompatibility. 
that means toxicity is reduced by two orders uh, when uh, we are concentrating the in the nano. So um, uh, to probe into the mechanism, we have done the drug release kinetics, which shows that a slower drug release uh, is and slower and sustained drug release is there for the nano conjugated systems. This makes the system much more uh, biocompatible and toxicity effects are much less. And the suddenness which uh, carried the drug, it is of uh, two to three nanometer uh, size, uh, which will be excreted through the urine. So uh, that is another advantage for sub five nanometer particles. It's tough for us to make tough sub five nanometer particles, but those are the materials which are useful for these purposes. So uh, for uh, the anti-cancer, we again tried with the uh, established drugs so of carboplatin and cisplatin. And we wait uh, with the same zinc sulfate, sub five nanometer particles, three to five nanometer size zinc sulfate. And we could see uh, the LD50 is enhanced a lot for the uh, uh, nano drug formulation. So, pure carboplatin LD50 was eight micromolar, while uh, for the nano drug it got 160. So, several order enhancements uh, for the biocompatibility. Uh, 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 Means toxicity is uh, much reduced after the uh, uh, nanotech formation. So I'm just uh, leaving these slides. It is the factors that uh, control the uptake and all. So by going to the wearable sensors, which is uh, having more relevance nowadays. So now coming to the wearable sensors, we know about Apple Watch, health sensors, everything, the wrist pad, the fitness pad, all those things we are regularly using. So it can sense, it can sense through mobile, and the Apple Watch will give the pulse rate, the heart which the rhythmic rate, ECG we can trace it using, uh, and we will be able to watch it with uh, the interfacing uh, uh, softwares in uh, mobile phones. So this is so easy, we will be able to see everything. So we will be able to communicate with the sensing device and uh, it gives this environment. So pressure can be sensed, BP can be sensed, uh, so many other uh, vital uh, parameters can be checked using variable sensors. So this was a variable patch, uh, which, uh, which will give uh, the ECG. Uh, uh, and this is a variable uh, sensor, uh, which is developed recently, which can uh, sense the cancer cells using the IR imaging system. So this is another variable sensor, which will give indication about the gases, poisonous gases. So it's a patch, it's a simple patch, which can be uh, applied. It's a thin, flexible, uh, uh, tattoo like thing which can be pasted on top of the uh, palm and we will be able to restore palm and we will be able to sense the uh, presence of poisonous gases in and around it. It's an environmental sensor uh, which uh, the uh, a person can use when he is going to, he, he is in a risk of uh, being exposed to such gases. So, so many such sensors are being developed, flexible, wearable electronics, which is, which is directed, directly um, uh, printable on top of the skin or which, which can be uh, applied as a tattoo or which can be applied just like uh, this, a patch or something like that. And wa uh, watch-like sensors are already in the market, wristbands and watches, uh, which we sense. So sensors are the most important part of this. This is actually a concept uh, which uh, we have applied to the uh, DSP CRP grant, I got the grant for actually uh, uh, the, uh, the sensor uh, which is having multiple sensing potential. Uh, temperature sensor, blood oxygen sensor, ECG, heart rate, respiration rate, blood pressure, uh, so many multiple sensing. So I have shown some of the sensor that is developed in our lab already, um, which can sense many things, just like temperature, pH, and then uh, the uh, hypoxia, uh, the uh, pulse rate. So uh, these sensors, if we can integrate together as a single part, how will we be able to use that for sensing multiple parameters? So that is what is really interesting. So here, uh, 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 such a uh, particular um, uh, electronic circuit which integrates all these sensing um, sensing circuits and uh, together it can work. And we can just use a, 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 an exciting source, just like a laser or a pointing, uh, pointer uh, from outside. And we can read the output uh, using any uh, interfacing software which is installed in our mobile phone. So we will be able to um, uh, sense multiple things uh, in a large scale. So uh, we can directly print those on uh, our uh, hand itself. Uh, so it's a printable uh, sensor. And if we can uh, make it printable on a flexible substrate and use it as a tattoo also. So these like uh, sensors are going to rule the market, sensing market uh, soon. 
So now come to the last thing, internet of things. As you, as I told, uh, I can communicate with my mobile phone. If I forget my mobile phone, I can just leave a ring on the phone and uh, search it out. But if I forget my pen or a costly uh, dress, it is not possible because we will not be able to communicate. So communication is very much important. So we want a network of things. Uh, no non-smart things will be there maybe in uh, the next 10 years. Everything will be made smart with smart uh, sensors. So sensors, uh, chips will be uh, integrated on top of all these systems and we can, uh, we can communicate with everything. So uh, just like uh, we are communicating mobile to mobile, mobile to tablet, mobile to computer, you will be able to communicate with anything and everything. So that makes the world uh, completely connected. That is called Internet of Things. So Internet is not just limited to smart systems. Internet is going to be um, made available for the other things, not smart things. So it is like we can, uh, we can get connected to everything so that we will be able to communicate. So for with sensors and memory uh, devices are too much important. And energy harvesters, which can trigger the sensors are also very much important. So you can see different types of sensors are required for this um, a light sensor, uh, the proximity sensor, the ultrasonic sensor, the flow sensors, the rain sensor, a lot of such sensor systems are required for making this such an interconnected world possible uh, in the near future. So you, you don't just uh, think like, okay, this is a future forecast of uh, 40 years, it will come in the next five years. So Internet of Things already happened and it is inviting actually. So you can expect uh, the entire things which will be interconnected uh, soon, maybe in the near five years itself, uh, you can see. Uh, so that is why sensing industry is going to flourish like anything in the semiconductor industry. So it's a technological revolution that is happening in semiconductor industry, sensing of all kinds. So, and miniaturization of the sensors, just like patches as I was saying. Oh, if my pen, if, if I'm making a bulk sensor and attaching on my small pen, it is meaningless. Right? So we have to make it thinner, 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 and making it uh, thinner to the range that we don't even see. That is why nano sensors are uh, having a lot of potential. So it can be uh, used uh, as a multiple sensing for, uh, element without even, uh, uh, we, we may not even require a uh, flexi substrate. Uh, we can directly uh, print that on uh, to the skin. So, and for triggering the sensors, we need energy harvesters. A lot of such options are there for the energy harvesters, but we know we will not be able to use batteries because batteries makes the entire thing bulky. So we have to go batteryless. We need not use battery at all. We have to use, we have to harvest energy from the surroundings. So which way, a lot of ways are there, but um, these wind and other mechanisms will not work if I want to make the, uh, the entire setup very thin. So only solar and uh, the piezoelectric harvesting will work. Piezoelectric harvesters are the harvesters which will uh, harvest energy from the vibrations. So pulse beat and any rhythmic beat can be used for uh, harvesting energy using piezoelectrics. So that is one of my uh, uh, major areas uh, of research other than the nanobiotechnology to make uh, the energy harvesters and sensors which are of piezoelectric nature. So, so a uh, lot of such uh, possibilities are there. You can see this is a piezoelectric based energy harvester. It's an energy harvester tile. So it can harvest energy and store. And uh, you, you see by walking, we will be able to generate uh, uh, the electricity. So now roads are being developed like this, which are which can harvest its own energy. So, uh, and this is a quantum road like uh, solar cells. Solar cells, uh, Anish already talked about solar cells, uh, how uh, we can harvest energy from sunlight. So it's not a new thing, it's, no, it's an age old thing. But now uh, how we can thin down is the main question. How much we can thin down is the main question. How much we can thin down will make our devices smaller, smaller, smaller. And how much we can add multifunctionality. So same solar cell, if, if it can work as uh, the piezoelectric energy harvest also, and same material, if we can add sensing potential also, then it is well and good. So that kind of uh, research is going in um, these things. So miniaturization, as you know, everybody knows that now we need not talk about uh, the computers which were there uh, 20 years before. They were so big and the memory capacity was so poor. Now, because of the inventions in nanotechnology, the storage density is coming larger and larger and coming to the range that it is approaching because transistors are going to be miniaturized to its ultimate dimension in the uh, next two years. 
actually it is already miniaturized but they are not uh, releasing the products right now so maybe in uh, next two years we will see the smallest transistors then we cannot really shrink down again but we want energy density much more we want storage much more we want to uh, uh, get the storage density which is there for the high supercomputer in uh, our small uh, tablet that is our dream right always so then what is left now miniaturization will not work because all are miniaturized now miniaturized to ultimate dimension then what more we can do we can add multifunctionality same component if we can sense if we can do then or the harvesting if we can work as memory unit if we can work as storage unit then the size can be reduced and density can be improved so such uh, in such direction we have to uh, look for multifunctional materials uh, in which piezoelectric ferroelectric multiferroic all these components uh, if it can be added together we will be able to you might have heard about ferroelectric rams ram random access memories so nowadays people are thinking about multiferroic rams magnetic magneto, magnetic rams are there ferroelectric rams are there they combining both together and making multiferroic rams so this is a new invention um, new, uh, so a lot of such developments are happening in those areas in developing rams the memory devices the storage devices which are thinner 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 and then even density is coming higher higher and higher so and now you know uh, nothing is impossible now using a pen like thing now uh, this is a uh, nano pen uh, it's a cantilever which is uh, used of course uh, to be post microscopy so uh, here nano uh, ink is being used and we can write any device just like we are drawing with a pen so such advancement are there uh, nowadays we can so this uh, shows the latest uh, uh, forecast so it's a thin graphene sheet and on top of that uh, they are uh, coating uh, it's a fetch field effect transistor so and then um, uh the uh, ebola virus uh, is getting attached to that surface functionalized gold nanoclusters which is coated on top of the graphene so an ebola sensor so virus sensor uh, of all kinds can be fabricated using the nano templates like this so uh, different kinds of it is it, it is actually the nano technologists uh, uh, who is going to play a role because uh, they have to engineer the surface in such a way that we can sense many things so for that for careful understanding of the virus structure is very important or careful understanding of other structures which uh, we want to sense is very much important and in accordance with that we have to tailor the nano material and uh, this shows uh, such advancement which will be uh, there, uh, happening soon maybe same same chip we will be able to use uh, with different uh, coatings okay chip need not be changed and for uh, multiplex diagnostics so we can use several several sections of the same sensor for uh, multiplex diagnostics just like the same sensor if we can uh, diagnose uh, h1n1 h1n5 uh, uh, fogage and uh, nipa and uh, chicken gonorrhea together that will be wonderful right so uh, because symptoms are same so most often we are worried about Uh, even with a small viral fever, we are worried, worried about COVID or anything like that. So, multiplex diagnostics sensors are very much important in that aspect. So, this is uh, something like energy you know, harvesters, which can send, which can uh, trigger these sensors. Uh, a lot of such applications are there for the magneto-electric based energy harvesters. So, I was mentioning about the piezoelectric energy harvesting. So, added to that, if magnetic field or Wi-Fi signal itself can trigger uh, the sensor. Yeah, it's wonderful, right? So that kind of uh, thoughts uh, will uh, promote these like batteryless operations uh, for going thinner, uh, thinner, and thinner uh, for the wearable sensors. Now come to the next section: implantable sensor sensors. So how we can implant these sensors inside? So uh, forget about uh, the sensors uh, which are bulky in nature. i'm talking about sensors which are thinner down to nanometers uh, so that uh, we will not have uh, be uh, uh, forced to wear that as a burden so it can be subdermal implants simple subdermal implants with a small small short video i'm uh, concluding this session uh, which is a bbc forecast uh, on the implantable sensors which will be ruling uh, the next decade so with that video i will uh, 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 Conclude this. So this is about storage and memory devices. So what is the advancement that is happening in nanotechnology? So uh, 
uh, these are some publications from my group, some uh, 30 publications are there in the field of sensors and object harvesters and uh, uh, nanotechnology related. So uh, now we will uh, move to the video, which will give you uh, uh, what will happen in the next five years in uh, wearable sensors. So let me go to that. Uh, Will you call me? Sorry? Will you call me? Will you give me a telephone? Yes. Where? Now. I'm sitting right here. This is why I wanted to have lunch. Will you just find me? Now? No, we don't see anything. Only voices, sir. Bethany speaking. Hello? Are you phoning for Bethany? Yes. What are you doing? Because Bethany can hear me. Well, you're right in front of me. But can you hear I'm me? Please share the, the video. So screen sharing is not Um, uh, it's too late, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, so maybe if you cannot yeah. do it, it's okay. Um, I think uh, now you will be able to see that. Will you call me? Sorry? Will you call me? Will you give me a telephone? Yes. Where? Now. This is, right here. this is why I wanted to have lunch. Will you just find me? Now? My hand is the phone. I can walk and talk because I'm on the phone, the phone inside my hand. I am the phone. This is what phones are going to be from now on. I have integrated. Thank you for your call. Some down in class. They charge themselves with motion like a self winding watch. And it's on the 22 network. I get signal across 95% of UK mainland, 98 by next year. When I phoned you, it was ringing. You were ringing. That's the speaker. So small. Okay. When did you get this done? That course in Winchester. I had one finger done every night. I still need to use a handset to phone out. Look. Hello. Hi. I can't believe you had surgery without telling me. Skin plants. Not surgery, and I knew you'd be cross. But I'm 18, and you had that tattoo when you were 18, and it's the same sort of thing. And I wanted to ask you, will you do me a favor? What? Will you tell Dad? Oh, sweet. Please, Lord. sweet, tell Dad for me.
wearable sensors. So uh, the wearable sensors uh, will uh, really uh, drastically change your life even because uh, it will be, it, it is just, uh, it can be implanted as subdermal implants without a uh, battery, you can go batteryless operations. So it can sense, it can uh, harvest energy from the surroundings, it can work and we can just take it away whenever you want because it's not implanted inside, it's just subdermal implants. So, um, phone, the entire phone can be integrated inside the pump. So, uh, that kind of advancements are going to happen in the next five years. Uh, so, we just short introduction, uh, sorry, short conclusion, I'm just stopping it here. I want to thank uh, all uh, my uh, PhD scholars um, who have been immensely contributing to the uh, works for the purpose because we can just throw ideas and vanish and they are doing all these hard works to make uh, uh, this up. So uh, thanks to all of, the, all of my uh, PhD students uh, and uh, my mentors and I thank the organizers for in, uh, inviting me and giving me an opportunity to talk to you. So uh, I think I'm you know, winding it up now. Uh, let me, uh, some more slides were there, but uh, I'm going at the top of time, which I don't. Uh, maybe uh, we can wind it up here and uh, session is open uh, for uh, questions and uh, if I know the answer, I will uh, answer. Otherwise, I can take it as a challenge in French or we can throw it as a challenge for you. So um, maybe you can uh, uh, interact, um, ask doubts or clarifications uh, based on the presentation or based on uh, some other uh, new studies or anything. I don't know how far uh, the, 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 the patients to ask questions because they are already starved, you know, because their, their uh, lunch time is 12.30. So <laughs> we have crossed that limit and maybe, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, 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 maybe that uh, they can email you their questions and you can answer them if you want. That's the way you can wonderful, do it. Wonder, any, any wonderful, question? wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh -huh. Wonderful speakers, both are. Nice. Okay, uh, so I think uh, we will we will not have the question answers for the time being uh, because uh, I don't want to. Uh, but uh, I, as uh, Dr. Annie uh, has said, uh, I'm sure both have great uh, potential. Both the work have. Uh, both talented speakers. We especially, know. especially yeah. I tell you, the nano nano particle and nano technology is the uh, word for uh, is the, is a magic word. It can do wonders uh, in the coming years, as you said. I don't know how the privacy is going to be maintained if you implant your, uh, you know, phone onto your fingers. <laughs> okay. that, I don't know who is going to. Be. You put the hand this way, and you are uh, filming me, you know, and that I will have a lot of. I'm I'm concerned about it. Maybe that that way, <laughs> you won't be able to give faith in anyone, and it's going to create a lot of harm. Maybe the technology is great. Uh, so now I just want to ask you one question. Now, maybe that other senses can work very well. No problem. We have methods to detect them. Uh, see, for example, almost all those uh, diagnostic devices are there. Uh, one of the greatest problems that we are facing is that we are not in a position to detect cancer early. Can any senses be made which can make an early detection of cancer? Because I know millions of people are suffering from cancer that only at the late stage that you come across a cancer. So maybe that there are, they say that there are markers being released in the blood and you can do that. But senses definitely, especially uh, cancers in the deep seated organs, if, if, if it can be detected, early detection, uh, do you have any idea of uh, any device that can go in for detecting the cancers at a very early stage before it is manifested. Sir, actually, I don't know what is what what is uh, happening to my speaker. It was not much audible to me. I thought it's not my so fault. Can... My speaker is working. <laughs> Why I said is again, it, again. It, it, you are audible. You are audible. You are audible. You, you, you are audible. You, you, you remove that and uh, listen to your. Hey. Speaker on the. Um, I think it is problem with my speaker. It is not much audible for me. Doctor, yeah, it is very much audible. You just speak. 
Uh, okay, can, can she is not audible. She is not audible. Um, I am not audible. Can repeat the, because uh, Nair sir's voice, uh, it is not audible for. Now the, the the question is very simple. That you have uh, methods to you have methods to detect everything. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. There are the gadgets available there, but one of those greatest problems that mankind is facing in early detection of cancer. Can any uh, device be made which can detect? You just place it on the body. And for deep seated cancers that it can detect. And I'm sure that millions will be served uh, through that. Do you have any uh, answer for that? Sir, what I'm saying is that you are not implanting, you are not making an intra, inter, interventional process. It's only on a surface that you put a gadget and then it senses. I don't know, maybe I will ask you through email later. Sir. Uh, so to, my, to, my, to my knowledge, there are no, no sensors. Ah, that's what I think. So they should develop. They should look yes, into sir. that yes, and develop yes, something. Yes, uh, yes, concentrate on that because yeah, yeah. It's no, no, nothing. Uh, yeah. nothing. Uh, Anish, Dr. Anish, uh, see, uh, of all those uh, 2D materials that you said, which one you feel has got great potential uh, application? Uh, Mainly semiconductor. Uh, uh, two dimensional material have great potential in the uh, uh, electronics world or uh, in the application field we you consider because uh, these are actually going to replace your current uh, the traditional materials like the silicon gallium mask etc so these are the materials are actually mainly uh, uh, using for the fabrication of all the type of devices in, uh, in the day to day life okay. so so semiconducting nano uh, two dimensional material mainly there are MOUs which have one type of material there are other class of materials in this class itself so by depending upon the property you can use these materials for different applications yeah what kind of uh, property changes would be there if you make any of these materials into that so for example if you want to fabricate a device for the solar cell application you only need a band gap which is matching to the wavelength in the visible region so you need to select a material of that particular kind. So you cannot use other materials for the converting this light into the, uh, for example, current. So, and also, for example, if you want to maybe fabricate any lasers, for example, if you are looking for a green laser, you need to select a material that having the band gap is in the, uh, that corresponding to that green or blue, whatever it is. So in that way, you can tune and the size also matters. Actually, if you tune the size, you can vary the properties. So at the same material, if you have different, different size, you can change the properties as well. So one thing is that uh, the material, the point, uh, the mainly the band gap actually we are looking for almost all the applications. And apart from the I mean, some other, other application, the photocatalytic application as well, we are using the constraint the bank of the material because the material is actually absorbing this light and that actually converts this water into the uh, free radical and that is actually attacking this uh, organic dye and all. So this mainly the band gap actually determines this almost all these properties. I was wondering that graphene being the thinnest uh, material known uh, into the world, mankind, uh, could it uh, also be used for main medical applications? Yes, sir. If uh, that, what are those applications that you would uh, I have not said more, uh, much more about the graphene material, but uh, uh, graphene also used in uh, many of the uh, medicine applications in the biofield as well. But uh, um, my uh, I'm, I have selected a material which is uh, the two dimensional material, uh, which is transition metal dichalcogenides, uh, because they have a particular band gap. So I have selected a material that have a band gap as well as it can be used for different bio and all other electronic applications. So graphene also we can use, uh, uh, but uh, I, have, I have not checked out much more about that graphene based systems. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, wish you all the best. I'm so happy. Thank See, you, you being very dear to me. I see <laughs> yeah. two people flourishing well in that uh, space. Very, very good. And, uh, I'm, I'm so happy. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I feel justified. Uh, stand justified for having invited both of you for giving this lecture. Kerala Academy of Sciences wishes you all very well uh, in your future.
uh, I, I think, uh, Professor Rani, there is no much time, so you can go. Okay, okay, okay. Shall I? Um, yeah, uh, Dina, Madam, shall I start my? Doctor. Shall I start, sir? Okay. Uh, no problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Think, okay. Uh, I ask the question to Sopna. Okay. 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 Sopna is typing her question. I think. I, I know. I know. She is okay, asking. Me to type. I have no time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Was able to uh, uh, hear Anir's voice uh, uh, better. I think some issue with my speaker because uh, uh, Naya so voice was not much audible for me. But, but my voice is audible to everyone, isn't it? <laughs> uh, everyone else. Yeah, yeah. Um, some issue, uh, people's voices are not audible. The students, for those who are, those who were announcing, that also was not audible for me. Maybe because some issue with the speaker. <laughs> Your speaker. Ah, uh, my desktop uh, speaker, yeah. <laughs> okay, Ali, please continue. Okay. Good afternoon, Manandol. I am so glad to be a part of the National Technology Day celebrations organized by Bellevue College of Pharmacy and Research Center in association with the prestigious Kerala Academy of Sciences. Before entering into my pleasant duty of proposing vote of thanks, let me congratulate the Bellevue College of Pharmacy and Research Center for providing an excellent platform for organizing such webinars. Also, I salute the visionaries, Mrs. and Mr. Krishnadas, for initiating such a big group of institutions in the suburbs of Trivandrum district. They passed away a year ago. Also, the present managing directors, Dr. Shaiju Alfi and Dr. Dina Das, are amazing couple and manage the institutes very well with good and scientific temper. On behalf of the Kerala Academy of Sciences and on my own behalf, I take this opportunity to express our heartfelt thanks to Mrs. Dina Das, Chairman, Delhi College of Pharmacy, for the inspiring presidential address. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks are also due to Dr. Shaiju Alfi, Managing Director, Dr. Manoj Kumar, Principal, for their initiatives, and Mrs. Praveena for the welcome address. Coming to our KS, Kerala Academy of Sciences, is a professional organization of scientists, technologists, physicians, academicians, and science managers. Hope our academy will flourish one day, like Indian National Science Academy, Delhi, or National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, or Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. Coming to our ever enthusiastic professor, Professor G.M. Nair, presently Director of CLIF, Central Laboratory for Instrumentation and Facilitation, University of Kerala, who formerly held prestigious positions like Professor and Head Department of Botany and Biotechnology, then uh, as director, the NDBGRI, and as chairman, Biotechnology Commission, Government of Kerala. GM Nicer is always our motivator, well-wisher, and a hardcore scientist. I take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to GM Nicer for inaugurating the function and delivering the inaugural address. Thank you. Thank you. General Secretary of KS, Dr. K.B. Ramesh Kumar, is the right hand of GM Nicer always willing to organize seminars, lectures, webinars, etc. of any sort. During their tenure only, Kerala Academy of Sciences has conducted maximum number of, of scientific programs. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, for your enthusiasm and goodwill. Then our stars of the day, Professor Sopnya Nair and Dr. P.M. Anish, are two great scientists. I do not know how can I, uh, how, uh, uh, how I uh, express my sincere thanks to them. They are, they are very great scientists in, in their prime age itself. Both gave us wonderful lectures in the emerging field of science and technology, nanoscience, 3D bioprinters, nano, um, uh, nanomaterials, nano in 2D materials, sensors, etc. And, and finally, implants and subdermal implants. Many, many sort you have. You have inspired us much. Very rare to get apt speakers in any function. I congratulate both Dr. Sopna and Dr. Anish for their wonderful lectures, and I wish them all success in their life. Also, also hope they will get the highest awards in science, like Shanti Saru Patnagar Award, and finally Nobel Prize itself. Wish, wish you all good luck. Yeah. On behalf of the Kerala Academy of Sciences and on my own behalf, I express our deep sense of gratitude to Professor Sopnya and Dr. Anish 
for sparing their valuable time in spite of their busy schedule and inspiring the young minds with modern tents and techniques in the science side, science and technology field. Thank you. I thank all the students, staff, and researchers for attending the webinar and making it a grand success. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Uh, if you if you look at the chat box, you will see some of those uh, uh, messages wherein Dr. Sopna has explained uh, about the biomarkers and. Science. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, some of the uh, now biochem chip is already developed for early uh, detection of prostate cancer. Uh, some other cancers like breast cancer, early stage detection is possible. And some wide spectrum screening potentially is there with uh, wearable um, biosensors um, with by IR mapping. So uh, full body IR mapping will give early signatures for heat rise in some particular location. And some pH changes can give early signatures. Those are wide, wide spectrum analysis, full body checkup analysis. But uh, specific markers, we have to find out the early markers first and then find out the uh, mechanism for sensing. Now, they, there are, I agree that there are, uh, there are uh, methods available, yes. but to an accurate detection, non-interventional. Yes, so yes. You understand that you should say that, okay, your body at a particular place has got a cancerous growth. Yes. Now, yes, if that, that is not, I'm sure, I'm, I'm asking you, yeah. Having done wonders in this field, probably you should devote much time because I'm sure that it's going to help millions of people. Yes, yes, yes. Research. So probably that is all the other things kept aside. I agree. But this is something. Yes, before, yeah, the, most of the cancers, if, uh, early, uh, leave biomarkers, early biomarkers 10 years before itself. It can be identified much well before it will be very good. The, 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 the thing is that this is a multifactorial disease. And that's true. Oh, that's right. That's right. So, changes. so yeah, you know, some changes that is yeah. Ha ha yeah. happening in the cellular function. Yeah. That yeah. abnormality, if it is being detected, yeah. I think uh, at least you okay. will. Definitely, definitely. I don't know. Anyway, uh, there is one more yeah. uh, comment from Dr. Uh, Biju Dharmabalan, a very uh, great uh, person uh, associated with Kerala Academy of Sciences. So she starts a national award in the name of Professor Vijay. Uh, probably we will think about it and maybe we are going to have a, 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 a Remembrance Day uh, being observed by Kerala Academy of Sciences soon. Uh, we will have, uh, we are trying to get the speakers who are very, very closely associated with Professor Vijayan. Uh, we are very particular about Professor Vijayan because Professor Vijayan passed away a few days back only and uh, he was uh, one of the recipients of the KS Honorary Fellowship. So we're very proud of him, son of the soil, down to earth scientist, and we'll definitely see that that will be done. Thank you, Biju, uh, for saying that. Anyway, I think we conclude. Uh, Dina, Dina. My national anthem is also there. Uh, okay, okay, please. <laughs> to the Daleview people, the people are starving. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, Thank you, sir. Actually, we were uh, very much uh, what, amazed with the technological uh, what, contributions Dr. Sopna and uh, Dr. Anish is giving. And uh, see, uh, the young people, I mean, our children, students, uh, it's a great uh, opportunity for you uh, for them to at least uh, talk to them, interact with them, listen to them, and get inspired from them. So thank you so much uh, for arranging such wonderful geniuses uh, for our students. <laughs> Madam, yeah. we are really thankful to you, Swapna Madam and Dani, sir. And thank we are uh, thank thankful you. to Central University also. And uh, thank you to the ASS. <laughs> uh, I'm not uh, repeating again because uh, we see as our partner. So uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Now we are going to slow, shortly, we are going to have some kind of association with CUK and Daleview. I'm connecting both, you know, so maybe you can make use of their health, uh, the strength. Thank you so much. Now, now, my my dear children, please proceed. Please raise for. Thank you, sir. It was a day well spent with so much valuable information and knowledge regarding technology. I thank each one of you present here for their memorable presence in this auspicious occasion. Thank you all. Once again, wish you all World Technology Day. Now, all of you kindly rise for the national. Thank you.
children uh, for your patient atten awesome. patiently yeah. attending the thing i yeah, know yeah. you will be like this even at six o'clock in the evening you know because i know that there will be students are so good so attentive <laughs> and so disciplined you know we show all the best and keep up that very good thank you this all congratulations okay okay so okay okay okay, okay. Uh -huh. making them so disciplined and so okay okay uh -huh. Uh, very, 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 very good speaker, sir. Okay, Sopnya and Dr. Anish. Okay. Thank All you. Good luck. Thank you. Too. I'm talking Thank about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, no, see the kind of, they are very, you know, vigilant. Yeah. And, uh, very... No, no, no. They, they are, they are so, they are not stopping. Means they ah, wish to yeah, convey they, their they don't thing. want to okay. go for that lunch is, also. That is the enthusiasm. <laughs> that is the enthusiasm. They don't want to go. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you, Dr. Anish. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. I'm so happy that the UK is, except for the Wi Fi problem. Whatever be the technical outside of the UK. I'm glad the internet connection. So, next time, that's a lesson learned to be learned, you know. So, you can do it. Yes, we need to arrange some other alternate internet. Their master UPS went down and they. And then later connected that to the main line and got encrypted in between many times. <laughs> Kids may go for lunch, please. Yeah, yeah. Please don't be interrupted. Okay, 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 okay. okay uh, sir. Uh, GM Nai, sir, from our team, okay. three, three and a half hours together. Okay, thank, you, thank you, thank you, teacher. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Where is Dr. Shaiju? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Shaiju, my job. Thank you, Dr. Shaiju, as well. Shaiju, my job. Do you have any visitors, sir? Well, he's an, he's he's visitor. So he's okay, okay. My regards to him. It's great. Okay, yeah. sure, sir. Sure. Oh, um, okay, sir. Bye bye. All of you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, dear Sopnya, there is a mention of uh, this uh, this printing, <laughs> bio printing, and all in Bible in two thousand years ago, in 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 the in the final chapters of Bible. Oh, okay. the, uh, uh, the, uh, the printed, the printing means the mudra. I'm going to Okay. Oh, okay, okay. In, in the Bible, there is a mention. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Anyway, so uh, now, put up. Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah, print. Yeah. And the same thing is going to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay, okay. <laughs> it will happen. Yeah. It will take, I think. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I said, I, I said, said, we have to focus on cancer also. It is a, it is a, an elaborate journey only. Even then, if you, uh, that is much beneficial to the public and the human kind. So, Dr. Sapna, are you a member yeah. of AS? Are you a member of Kerala Academy of Sciences? No, sir. So please oh. become a leader. <laughs> Anish, are you? No, no, please. No, no, become, no, no. Please become. You, <laughs> Then only you are. You start from here. Okay, okay. You start from here. Then you will be. Then you will become the member of other other academies also. Yeah, yeah. Do it now, please. Okay, okay. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jim. Nice, sir. Okay, okay. Bye, bye, bye. Okay, sir. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.